So welcome to the 130th Sustainability Salon, um, where we are continuing our longtime tradition of talking about air in the fall, because everybody likes breathing in the autumn. We go outside and we see all the beautiful leaves, and this year has been more beautiful than usual. I hope everyone has had a chance to spend some time in the outdoors, and um, whether here or elsewhere around the leaf peeping world, because uh, it's been really lovely. Um, so we are completing a two month series on air. Last month, we were uh, looking north a lot, north and west to the situation with the new shell uh, ethane cracker plant, uh, plastics manufacturing facility, which has already started spewing junk into the air. Um, and uh, I'm going to make Mark a co-host in case he has any of those um, graphics he wants to throw up. I might have if I thought of it, but I didn't. So, um, Mark, you want me to throw up some shell graphics? Yeah, those ones that show okay. those ridiculous flares full of black smoke into the sky. They're, Facility is not even open yet. It's not regulated uh, very well because they're on their conditional permit or still on their construction permit. And uh, so anyway, we talked about that a lot last month in October. Uh, and this month, we're going to look a little more south and also just generally around the region, um, uh, starting with, uh, do you have one handy, Mark? May as well just complete that thought. If not, you're muted anyway, and I'm I'm sorry to catch you flat-footed. <laughs> yeah, I need to log in from my desktop computer, oh, okay. and I got, yeah. I yeah, I mean, I actually have one too. If I go into here, um, yeah, I think. Okay, make my other self uh, co-host. Oh, okay. Um, there you are. There's yeah. two of you. Okay, and this is just recapping because some of these graphics were absolutely insane. Um, and last month we also had uh, Matt Mihalik talking about the role of the Breathe Project in connecting and supporting many different uh, air quality related organizations in the area. It's just, I can't mention shell cracker plant without showing a share, flare photo. And yeah, I've got all those. Um, and three, two, one, share. Yeah, that's how bright it is at night and how weirdly orange the sky the looks. Flare. And here's that flare which they've been doing, there's been multiple times of this flare going and going, and that just doesn't seem healthy. And weird flares that are hidden from the ground but illuminate the sky above. And Mark knows how to uh, adjust color balance, so it's really doing that, <laughs> making it all weird and orange. So, uh, Yeah, it's just going on and on. And some yeah, of the stuff they are probably doing at night so you can't see how black it is. Okay, and Marcy, you had something to say? Yeah, um, do you remember what the dimensions were on that? They said at the eyes on shell meeting what the dimensions were. You mean on, on the flare? flare how tall it is, yeah. Oh. I don't know that. Yeah. But it looks Do you big. remember that, Mark? Uh, I should have written it down, but it was just an incredible number size. Yeah, that's um it's it's huge and it's dissipating because it's going up into the sky, but that's a lot of material that's been raining out and 
dispersing into the uh, into the atmosphere. Caroline, you had a comment. Oh, your hand is raised, so hmm. better change that. Uh, can I? I can lower your hand if you're done. Okay, so. So now, so that's what we were mostly talking about last month. Um, and this month, uh, we have several um, people who think a lot about the Mon Valley and about our region in general, our county in particular. Um, uh, Patrick Campbell is the executive director of the Group Against Smog and Pollution, or GAST, a, I don't know, 54 or so year old, 53 year old air quality organization that has been doing um, advocacy, helping write better regulations, legal work, uh, suing or threatening polluters, sometimes suing regulators when they aren't doing everything they could. Um, and uh, we also will have a regulator. We kind of have a couple of regulators, although only one is scheduled as a speaker. Um, Caroline Mitchell is a chemical engineer, is an attorney. <laughs> and is a member of the Allegheny County Board of Health. So she is um, on the ground with regulations and knows and will share with us some of the constraints that they're operating under and just how business works in that process. And that is, it's a wonderful opportunity. And we'll also have, um, well, on the government side, I note that one of our attendees, Anita Prezio, is a county council member um, and uh, is has been an extremely consistent ally of every environmental cause and social causes as well. Um, so is we are so fortunate to have her on uh, our county council. Um, and everybody can see the little applause. And uh, and Mark Dixon is a tremendous local advocate. Um, Barbara Brandon is a physician and advocate. Uh, Janice Johnson and Chie Togami are on the board of uh, GASP, and Kelly Henderson is just uh, joining us um, all on the board of GASP, uh, along with myself. And um, But none of us that I've mentioned so far, I don't think, are folks who are really living the problem. So. Uh, we have the, the biggest polluter in Allegheny County is Clareton Coke Works, and it's not the only industrial facility on the Monongahela River. And um, uh, I think I will become big. It's not the only uh, industrial facility on the Monongahela River, but it is uh, very dangerous for people to breathe around. And uh, so, Melanie Mead is here to share her experiences with us. And I think we'll start with Patrick. I'm just trying to maneuver my screens around. We'll start with Patrick, um, who, as I said, is the director of GASP, um, fairly newly the director. I guess it's been a couple of years now, maybe a year or two, uh, year and a half. About 14 months, I think. <laughs> a little over a year. Yeah, a little He's a over fresh a year. baby director. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, we're very fortunate to have him, as we were fortunate to have our previous director, Rachel Filippini, who was with us for quite a number of years. Um, and uh, before that, Suseppi, who is still on staff. Uh, Rachel has gone off to do um, environmental education work closer to home. She lives mm -hmm. up the Allegheny River. And uh, but uh, now we have. Patrick, and he's looking at things with fresh eyes and uh, helping lead GASP into its second half century. Um, and so Patrick will share some of GASP's many initiatives and also uh, in especially what we're doing um, in the Mon Valley. Uh, and I think that and, and also another unusual thing about this salon is normally speakers might come and go as they talk about their little subset of a topic. But this time, all of our speakers are going to be able to be here the whole time. And I think that's tremendously important because usually they hear from each other in little three minute testimonies um, or in a published statement. 
uh, from the Board of Health or whatever. I don't even know how much speaking individual members of Board of Health are able to do. So I really appreciate that Carolyn can join us. And I think we could have some really wonderful uh, and important conversations here. So for now, I'm going to turn it over Perfect. to Patrick. Um, and uh, any, I think you're a co-host, so you can share slides. Um, for everyone, as we get going, don't forget to hydrate and eat, eat as you need. And um, we will uh, see what we can see here. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Marin, and and thank you uh, everyone who's been who's been able to join here uh, this afternoon. I uh, I'm I'm always amazed at the amount of skill and talent and and uh, diversity of experience that that gathers this quickly in a in a virtual space, and I'm I'm humbled to be a part of uh, a part of that with you, with you all this eve or this afternoon and into a little bit this evening. So. So as Marin said, I'm uh, I'm I'm the executive director of the group against smog and pollution. Uh, I've been in this role 14, 15 months, uh, give or take a couple of weeks. Uh, but uh, but but it's it's been great to be a, a part of an incredible board, an incredible staff, and and working in the communities and with residents that. Uh, that that GASP has been a part of and and also working with for since 1969 for about 53 years. Uh, GASP was formed as a as an organization led by volunteers. It was it was formed around kitchen tables and in in living rooms uh, by people who were affected uh, by air pollution, uh, folks who had asthma and other kinds of respiratory related uh, illnesses. And and the the goal of the group was to to elevate uh, to elevate the experience of the experiences of those residents. At the same time, working to uh, working to illuminate the open secret of air pollution causes health impacts. It causes disease. And and they did that by going after uh, going after doctors to uh, and researchers and scientists who who uh, were already busy making the connections between air pollution and and health impacts. And so in those past fifty three years, GASP has has uh, worked with regulators as well as as well as residents to hold industries accountable for their air pollution. That's done through education, that's done through advocacy, uh, that's done through watchdog work uh, and and some work that is uh, that it, or, that involves writing better and stronger regulations uh, and partnering with those uh, with those regulatory agencies to to uh, help uh, help enact those. And and so part so I'm going to share with you the, this uh, this afternoon a couple a couple projects a couple things GASP is focusing on already as well as in, into the coming year uh, that that help address air quality related education uh, watchdog work as well as advocacy. So I didn't prepare slides, but I do have visuals ready in my back pocket. So I'll be sharing uh, sharing my screen here in a minute. But uh, but I'm I'm thankful that I get a chance to talk with you all about this, and uh, happy to pause for questions at the end. And as Marin said, I'm I'm sticking around the whole time uh, for this this salon and and looking forward to uh, our discussion uh, throughout the throughout our time. So so one. One area uh, that GASP is always looking at is how uh, how do we equip uh, younger people with the tools and education they need to uh, to be able to advocate for air quality for for improved air quality in our in our region. So particularly for Allegheny County, uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, GASP Pittsburgh partnered with a GASP Alabama. That is based in Birmingham, and and GASP in Alabama stands for the Greater Birmingham Alliance to Stop Pollution, and so the Group Against Smog and Pollution and the Greater Birmingham Alliance to Stop Pollution partnered together uh, 
to work to to elevate the voices of uh, to elevate the voices of young people, high school students, uh, in in equipping them with air quality education, as well as uh, as well as some of the tools and skill sets that our two gasps have, uh, things like being able to talk with the media, being able to talk with uh, researchers and scientists, interviewing uh, interviewing elected officials, uh, those kinds of skills, and also it was an opportunity for for the GASPs to learn from, uh, learn from high school students uh, it, about where the, maybe where the growing edge is for, uh, for social media platforms and what are the most effective ways to, to make sure uh, we're doing our best as an organization to, to, engage with, uh, to engage with high school students. And, uh, and so throughout the course of this first year of the project, uh, they, students were able to interview uh, people like Summer Lee, uh, Dr. Uh, Jeb De uh, Deb Gentile uh, here. Uh, Gasp Birmingham also has attorneys like Gasp in Pittsburgh, and uh, one of the, the Gasp Birmingham attorneys was able to uh, share with the students what it looked like uh, to to analyze permits and advocate in a in a in sometimes a litigation format. Um, and so the students had lots of lots of questions uh, based on based on that experience. Uh, so I want to share share my screen here with you all for for a moment uh, to show you. Let me grab the right screen. I have two screens, and so that makes it fun to guess which one I'm grabbing. So here we are. So I hope you can all see my screen and. And within this, you'll see just simply raw clips of uh, interviews with with Summer Lee, and uh, everyone, of course, is looking forward to looking working with Summer here in the in the in the coming sessions. But uh, interviews with Deb Gentile, and the uh, students learn how to do some light video editing to to pull these these things together. Uh, and and publish these on social media platforms, uh, and then they also worked on infographics, taking the air quality related knowledge they had, and translating it into uh, into a way that's easy for students as well as anybody to 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 utilize. So let me let me share one. So this is the major criteria pollutants that the EPA keeps an eye on, uh, and so you'll see here they created this. Uh, they created this really wonderful infographic on carbon monoxide and impacts, lead, nitrogen dioxide, ground level ozone, particle pollution, and sulfur oxides. And so these are all formatted in a way that can easily be shared with, on social media and uh, and and in other kinds of platforms. They also thought about ways uh, air pollution impacts uh, impacts environmental justice communities uh, and so created some more infographics here and all of these uh, are on our website so you're welcome to check them out on, at your leisure anytime uh, they also thought about ways that uh, today uh, residents can can make a can make a difference in living more sustainably and they shared that here as well as some resources about how you can keep an eye on air quality, Air Now's resource through the EPA, as well as our local Pittsburgh Smell Smell Pittsburgh uh, app to share uh, to share qualitative experiences of uh, the air pollution, as well as uh, always encouraging if you live in Allegheny County to uh, to get connected with the health department, whether that's keeping an eye on their website. Uh, as well as learning about regulations and uh, also where to make air quality related complaints. So that was the first year of the, that was the first year of the, the, what we called the Fresh Voices Project. We're now in the second year of that project where 10 students from Pittsburgh, as well as 10 students from Birmingham, Alabama are, are, are together meeting virtually and uh, we we just spoke uh, this past week with uh, Dr. Sally Wenzel at, at Pitt University, uh, learning about 
air quality and how it impacts uh, health, particularly asthma. Uh, and so we're going to continue these meetings once per month from now and through May, and we'll have another student-directed uh, project uh, like you just saw uh, that the students will put together and, and share, uh, share to our networks here in the Pittsburgh area, as well as, uh, as, well as in Birmingham. So that's the one thing we do is try to try to equip as many people with air quality regulate or air quality education and understanding of regulations as possible. The the next thing we do it, it related to our uh, much of our watchdog work is is GASP is fortunate to have two staff attorneys who spend uh, much of their time researching and inspecting air quality related permits in. Uh, Allegheny County, as well as uh, southwestern Pennsylvania. And so uh, what we thought was, it, it, they were, Gasp was thinking about this years ago, uh, instead of just holding on to that, that good work that our attorneys and others do to, to actually inspect these permits, uh, Gasp thought it would be a good idea to share uh, share what our attorneys are looking at with uh, with residents everywhere. So what what GAS did was develop an air permits clearinghouse, and so that that lives uh, currently on our website. We uh, we actually have been for the past several uh, several months working to update our website, and so I will shamelessly show that to you right now. Uh, because that reflects just uh, a lot of, lot of work <laughs> from uh, staff and, and thankfully some other volunteers who, who were able to help us out. So please go and, and check out our website. There still are a little thing, couple things we're ironing out. As anybody who's designed a website knows, that takes, uh, just takes forever to get everything smooth. But, uh, but the important thing of what I want to show you here is, is smooth. Uh, so under resources, if you go to our Air Permits Clearinghouse, Click on that, and what it'll do is, uh, we put together. I, I think about a couple years ago now, two years ago, I uh, uh, how to use the clearinghouse, and so visit this website anytime and, and check out this YouTube video, and it shows you how to use the clearinghouse. But the long and short of it is, uh, if you scroll down, you can see this uh, major map of. Uh, facilities, these are major polluters, uh, or uh, sites that use a Title V permit um, in southwestern Pennsylvania. And so what we did was also break this out by county by county. And so, for example, if you click with click on Allegheny County, this will bring you up to a, a, a map that you can either click on facilities and look at, or um, you can you can go that way if you just have an idea of where your facility is, or if you know where your uh, the name of the facility, uh, you can search for it that way. And so what we've done is we've linked Title V operating permits and other related documents uh, to the website, so it's right there, so you can easily find it and see it. And this is uh, this is a, a nice benefit. Um, I'm always hearing from our from our organizational partners about how they go out and you and and use this permits clearinghouse to see previous comments on a particular site. Like if you click on that, you can see some. Uh, let me see if it loads. But if not, no worries. Um, either way, you can check it out on your own, and uh, you can see our previous comments from attorneys back. Um, uh, in this case, uh, from January of 2017 on this facility. And so this is a great resource that we uh, we try to make available to, obviously through our website, to residents and partners. That way, uh, that way it, it, it takes some, I think it takes some of the mystery <laughs> out of what is in a permit, as well as, uh, as well as what other air quality organizations are saying about, uh, about that permit and how it can be strengthened. Uh, Whenever permit uh, permits do come up from many of these major Title V holding sites, we also put throughout our website, um, we'll, we'll put opportunities and ways for residents to create their own comments and submit to the health department, uh, being able to share their experiences sometimes of living next to, uh, next to a site uh, 
um, you know, we want to make sure our, our regulators hear what it's like to, to live next to a particular site. So, and, and the other thing is too, uh, what you'll find is when you look through these operating permits and review memos and, and all of that, it is a, it, they're, they're incredibly complex. Uh, they're, it, it takes some experience to, uh, to be able to understand what's going on in them. So, so if you ever have questions, if you're, if you're checking out this resource as well as, uh, as, well as maybe an upcoming permit uh, that you see the Allegheny County Health Department posted uh, is up for comment or is in draft form, please feel free to reach out to GASP. Uh, we, we're always happy to talk with residents and anybody else and try to answer questions and partner with you in, in, completing, uh, in completing comments. It's one way residents can, can have a voice and, and share their experiences with regulators. And so the final thing I want to share with you um, this, this evening or this afternoon is our... Um, we, we're putting together currently a project uh, called an air quality primer, as well as uh, sharing that primer through workshops. So what we're doing is we're going to Allegheny County and the surrounding counties and partnering with their, uh, partnering with their elected leaders, as well as their staff, in order to put this primer uh, before them. Uh, because because I think many times uh, uh, elected officials come with a whole bunch of experiences, and sometimes that doesn't mean, and sometimes that means they're making decisions about air quality, but don't have, uh, but necessarily don't have the a background in understanding uh, how their decisions impact air quality. And so we wanted to take some of that mystery out. <laughs> we wanted to uh, create a primer that would share resources with elected officials and their staff so they, they can have uh, all the tools they need to make well-informed air quality decisions for their, uh, for their municipality. Uh, so we have just finished putting together the primer, which is going to live on our website in an electronic format uh, but right now it is just in a in a hard copy printed format. Uh, and so I'm sharing my screen here of of what it looks like in the printed form. And so we'll be making this more electronic friendly as it as it goes to live on the website here in the coming weeks. But you can see the contents of what we're trying to get in front of. Uh, in front of uh, regulators or, or in front of uh, elected officials. And so we go into uh, permits, uh, we go into open burning and, and building and demolition. We also wanted to make sure this is, uh, this is providing, um, providing elected officials with resources. We just don't want to say, <laughs> here's what you're, you're maybe doing wrong or here's what you could do better. Uh, but not providing any means of uh, figuring out what that looks like or or what that means. And so we're providing uh, incoming funding resources, uh, ways for air quality monitoring and data. And we've included model uh, ordinances and other fact sheets in an appendix. Uh, so we're going to be going around to out, starting in Allegheny County and the surrounding counties uh, to to share this primer as well as uh, explain in a high level way of what is what is in this primer, uh, and the other thing is uh, we as part of this purchase and it, as you can see it's uh, a, from a grant through uh, the Pennsylvania DEP. Uh, we're, we also purchased um, uh, air quality or excuse me uh, we also purchased uh, purple air monitors uh, low cost. Uh, PM monitors. And so uh, what we're planning on doing is gifting a monitor to every county uh, where we do a workshop. And so that means uh, Allegheny County, Beaver, Butler, Fayette, Washington, Armstrong, Westmoreland. Uh, we're planning on gifting these um, uh, Purple Air monitors to uh, to that elected official or to those uh, to that municipality where uh, the county so uh, residents then have a resource where they can go and see uh, 
go to the purple air map and see uh, see the uh, their particular purple air monitor. Uh, it's a way we're hoping to kind of fill in maybe uh, some of the gaps just a little bit uh, in that purple air monitoring map. Um, and so, uh, so those those are a couple of the ways that we're looking at helping uh, helping provide resources and partner uh, with uh, with as many people as we can. Uh, that's something GASP is always. Uh, has has always had a strong um, a strong inclination to do is partner with anybody who wants to be in partnership with us in order to promote and uh, increase uh, and develop healthier air for our for our region. Um, and so so these are just a couple of the ways um, we're we're looking into that. Uh, we've also uh, worked really recently. Um, we were awarded by the EPA. Uh, now, when I say we, this reflects a whole lot of groups, <laughs> not just GASP. This reflects uh, uh, Protect Elizabeth Township, uh, this uh, um, Valley Clean Air Now, Allegheny Clean Air Now, Birmingham Uptown Group, the Breathe Project, uh, Carnegie Mellon's Create Lab. We all together uh, developed a a. EP, uh, monitoring grant to the EPA so we can purchase 96, I think, uh, purple air monitors that we can fill in within the Mon Valley as well as Neville Island and the, and the Uptown area. Um, and also we're, we're uh, going to be using SUMA, uh, SUMA canisters to take SUMA sample, large air samples of uh, air during a smell event is indicated by reports on smell Pittsburgh, uh, the smell Pittsburgh app. So what we're uh, what we're hoping to do is send those uh, send those uh, SUMA samples uh, to an EPA certified lab to do a speciation analysis to find out what is in the air uh, during a smell event. Um, and so uh, we're that's a three year project and we're we haven't even been uh, awarded money yet, <laughs> but but we know it's coming and we're uh, we're excited to begin working with all of our partners to uh, to to figure out how to tie qualitative and quantitative analysis of of what's in the air uh, during smell events. And so uh, stick around. That's uh, that we'll be we'll be uh, sharing our our results uh, from that study far and wide. Um, so, so thank you all. Um, and we're, I'm happy to keep talking, but I don't, I don't need to take any more time. I'm really excited to hear, uh, from Melanie and Caroline too. All right. Thank you so much, Patrick and GASP, which is inclusive of several of us here. Um, if anybody has, I don't think there were any questions, although Melanie noted in the chat uh, having met the gas group from Birmingham, Greater Greater Birmingham Alliance to Stop Pollution, um, while at a climate reality training, uh, and just notes that they're another really awesome group. So uh, again, if uh, I'm not sure I said it before, but um, any questions during the presentations, feel free to poke them into the chat. Um, and uh, I will now bring up Melanie to say hi across the screen to Patrick. <laughs> and so Melanie um, is a longtime multi-generational uh, resident of Clareton, Pennsylvania. Um, in the Marin's List event description, I um, uh, linked to a wonderful article that was done uh, about Clareton, just to give you a picture in general of the larger Clareton area uh, or the, the, the community and all the different issues that they are facing, um, a longtime steel community and um, uh, dominated by this Coke plant, uh, which uh, if, if it doesn't get talked about, we can fill folks in later on what a Coke plant is. I have some uh, photographs of it that can give a sense of scale, but I didn't want to 
uh, get in the way of anything that Melanie wants to share firsthand because you live down there with it. So um, uh, Melanie has been active and vocal um, and uh, is involved in several ways um, with different organizations, Clean Air Council, and I think you're part of the new Center for Shared Prosperity uh, out of Carnegie Mellon. Um, and so, yeah, when Ela came and asked me, you were one of the first people, who should we get who lives in the community and deals with this at a deep, both a high level and, a, and an intimate level. And uh, you were top of the list. So, uh, so yeah, take it away, Melanie. Thank you so much for being here with us and sharing your story. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, so many of you have been the reason why I don't give up. Um, when I returned here in 2013, I thought that I would quickly get back to North Carolina and start my apothecary. So um, having transitioned from the focus of the natural environment uh, and learning about the health harms in Clareton, I thought, why aren't we doing something? Uh, why isn't our mayor and our city council actively speaking out and educating the community? What GASP offers is a very clear way of, of serving the youth and the community uh, to help them understand their role. Um, when Patrick was talking, I was thinking it's very difficult to know where to go if you want to make a, a, a file a complaint and when you go to the county health department. And so First off, the people here in this community are overburdened, they're marginalized, they're working maybe two jobs and still not able to make ends meet. So asking them to fill out a comment or complaint already is taking time that they may not feel that they have. So uh, whenever I learned about gas from the Clean Air Council, I was introduced I was thankful to see that they had a component to engage our youth. In Clareton, most of what they engage our youth in is football. And we all know about the brain concussion theory by Dr. Bennett Amalu. He was actually here in Clareton and he wanted to research the number or the brain concussion here with our youth. But our mayor and our city council didn't allow him to proceed. So when you have a what, what they call an industry run town, and Marin can probably give you more history than I can, groups like GAS, Rockus, uh, um, Clean Air Council, all, all Breathe, all of these groups help someone like me make sense of it all. And that's what is um, difficult. Uh, like Patrick mentioned, translating the information uh, being able to identify what which actions are the next um, steps to take, and then learning who do you need to get uh, on your team, you know, who are the stakeholders, as they say, that will help things happen. Um, since the fires in 2018, I, I haven't seen or I haven't felt like the Allegheny Health Department has cared, and I haven't seen them engaging our community in a way that would motivate people to take more action. So it's it's helped me uh, that I have groups like GAS where I can say, hey, here's the rule, here's the science, and this is what you can do. And then in some cases, we have other groups who create form letters that people can just sign on to until they feel like getting more active in their organizing. Um, my, my son, since he's been able to hang out with me uh, on occasion, he took a picture during uh, Halloween of a dark brown plume that was coming from the USX Coke Works. And it was only because he's been around me in these meetings that he even thought to do that. And that's what I'm saying about what GASP has offered and what other groups like that offer is being thoughtful of the people that you're serving so that they know that they have a voice that is of value, as well that they know that their issues are worthy to be resolved. A lot of times the community will say, I don't, they don't care about us. They don't care what happens to us. 
And I say, well, I care about you and you care about you, don't you? And so that's what a lot of the work um, being like boots on the ground, I, I, I don't know those terms all the way, but that's what I think a lot of the work is, is encouraging people that their stories matter, um, identifying who has the correct information, not the disinformation that the Claritin Coke Works spills out. You know, they have the huge sign site, continuous improvement to the environment, which is a, a blatant lie, I think. And they shouldn't be allowed to market that lie because the younger people in the community don't realize how harmful it has been. They, they have endured the deaths. We have um, one in 20 people diagnosed with cancer. And in most cases, the BIPOC are the ones to die from the cancer. It could be because of um, medical injustice. Um, there, there are several reasons, but I also think that it's because we don't have medical doctors in our area to speak about it. And if you don't have medical doctors and nurses at hand to explain how these, um, how this air pollution causes health issues and why you should speak out, then you have a, 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 an active town like what we see right now in Clareton. But I'm encouraged that with more talks like what Marin offers here, um, more activity from gas and gaining access to more people with more information. Uh, Mr. Art Thomas was one of the first people I thought of whenever I started this work. Um, and that was when Dave Smith was involved with uh, Clean Air Council and his wife uh, suffers from sarcoidosis. And there's um, not a lot of information easily accessible to us for him. And so I'm connecting with more people, medical doctors and lawyers who have maybe reviewed this in the environmental scope to help him because he doesn't plan on moving. His wife and his family, they've all lived here most all of their life like myself. I don't want to give up our family home to go live in cleaner air, but I do want that if I were to move a family in here that they would have the right to know. We just recently opened up the Clareton Inn, $14 million they put into new housing that they found out is not, it, they didn't use the best materials. So they used a lower level material to build it. They're building it in an environmental justice area where the people aren't even, they don't know that they're moving to a community that, that has uh, industry that's harming their health. It's not blatantly spoken about. And so people say, well, why did, did you, didn't you know that industry was there? Well, who would think that you would allow an industry to cause harm whenever you have the, like the stay rule, which is a safer technologies analysis so that you can say to this industry, there's a better way of doing it and it, it's a safer alternative. Everyone should be on board with that, but it's not. And that's why people like Patrick and Carolyn are important to me because we have access, you know, forgive me, you know, for not knowing all of the terms, but I feel comfortable enough that I can sound like a fool, possibly, you know, asking this question, well, why is this done? And, and I feel safe that they will guide me and support me in getting the right information and sharing with the community. Uh, <clears throat> And, and as well, that's why these meetings, these salons are important because it gathers us. Here in Clareton, I don't have a place to have these meetings. I, I have asked the Clareton Library uh, on several occasions, even for the Center for Shared Prosperity. And I was told that the Clareton Library is uh, privately owned. And that goes to the history that I learned from um, Matt Mihalik at Breathe was the libraries were made for the community for the communities so that they could educate the community in as much as they wanted them to know. So Carnegie created these libraries in steel industry towns and they gave the steel industry people just what they needed, but not anymore. And if you were to give me one of your most recent books that you've read on environment or climate issues or justice, I can't go to my library and pick up one of those books. 
I, I, I can't, I may have to wait a long time to order it because it may have to come from a library in the city where there are more people actively using them. So we still have um, limited access to correct information. And that's, that's a, great, a great problem. But as we've mentioned here with these changes, like this money that's going to be given to the air quality, I think it, for me, it's good to show our youth that this type of work will allow you to pay your bills. Uh, I think that assume that th this type of work doesn't, doesn't give you good pay. And our youth need to know this is valuable. Taking pictures and knowing how to use this type of technology to protect your community is going to pay for you uh, to live your life. And as well, you're going to be helping out future generations. And when they see that someone is, has opportunity to gain those type of awards, what we just recently uh, learned, that, that helps them to identify and see where their talent and skill can fit in. Um, and I'm going to use uh, that to my son to show him about how he, he sharing how he decided to take the picture and why with other friends so that we can start to gather a youth group here because anytime, uh, like Marin mentioned earlier, when you learn something, when you share the information, uh, that, that, that helps you know that you have learned it well and it, 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 and it um, makes it more valuable to you. And I think that if we were to have an environmental education forum in the community, it would allow the students to know that their life experience is valuable and it shouldn't be lived in this way. It shouldn't have to be lived in this way. So that's what I think is great um, about these programs that you all take into consideration the community and the community's needs and desires as well. You understand and meet the community where they're at and giving them information and engaging them until they want to move on. And, and that's what I think is um, so great about what you all do. And I'm very thankful to be a part of it. Uh, and I'm humbled because when I was in high school in the early 90s, my science teacher taught me about Al Gore and his mission. And here, because of the work that I've done with you, I've actually um, been able to participate in that. And I don't know that, you know, where, where I was going in life, I never saw this. So to be here and to have such a, a great group of people around to support me really lets me know that I am ancestor protected and we have great value in coming together in these type of salons to find out who has the right information and how we can all support each other. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Melanie. I had to unmute there. Um, so uh, that's that's as the remote sensing scientific community calls ground truth. Um, what what Melanie and her neighbors are experiencing on a day to day basis. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and so our third, and, and typically, uh, I mean, I know you've come and testified at public hearings, Melanie, and uh, that's, that's important and vital so that the EPA or the County Health Department or the DEP had, uh, can, can hear from residents about what their concerns are, what their hopes are, um, and what they're dealing with every day. Uh, but that's usually in three minute chunks and without any dialogue. Very occasionally, someone on a board, a hearing board may ask for some clarification, but it hardly ever happens. Um, I know that during the, the parks, um, protecting the parks from fracking, uh, the county council, they did each make a statement, but that was pretty unusual. I usually find the hearings as fairly one-sided and the, the board is discussing things amongst themselves and they're letting public speak. 
but they don't um, necessarily, uh, you don't know what each of them is thinking. So I'm going to add another spotlight here. Can we guess who it's going to be? It's Caroline. <laughs> and um, so uh, we know that when we go, and I'm going to bring all of our speakers up for just a moment. Um, when we go and we testify, and I do it some, but Patrick does it more because that's his job and uh, he can make time for it. Um, more readily. And uh, Melanie is living, I mean, I'm speaking for the world, for climate, I'm speaking for the community of Clareton, and I'm speaking with a certain amount of, um, you know, scientific background. Uh, the main use I get out of my PhD in planetary science is to introduce myself as a planetary scientist, to give myself, give my comments more gravitas whether I'm talking about geology that's going to cause landslides, which later happened on a development project and on a different development project, but it was very gratifying when it happened and stopped a Walmart from being developed in the South Hills. Um, and I had talked about that in my first testimony after coming to Pittsburgh was about how the hillsides of Pennsylvania red bed clay were going to, when you deforest them to build a giant retaining wall, it was likely to slide down. And that happened um, on a different project. And so, uh, and, and I, can, I can say things, but they're not so much from my personal experience because I live here on the ex edge of a 600 acre park and isn't that nice, but, um, and we do certainly experience the overall Pittsburgh air quality issues, uh, but it's when, um, somebody like Melanie is, uh, is experiencing data, you know, family dying of cancer right and left. And, you know, it's probably related to the air pollution that we're all living with. And we're stuck here because, uh, that's what environmental justice communities are about. Um, uh, being unable to fight off a a newly locating facility because you don't have the time or resources or being having a hard time living with it because you don't have the resources to move away. So, uh, but there's rarely a dialogue back and forth. And there's a lot of things that we as citizens don't know about the considerations that are being considered by those hearing boards, by the DEP and the EPA and the Health, the, the Board of Health, the Health Department. So this, I am so pleased to bring this group of people together. Um, and uh, Caroline has some observations about, and again, Caroline is a chemical engineer, an attorney, and a member of the Allegheny County Board of Health, which is the body that decides on the rules by which we live. Well, a combination of the Board of Health and the and the county council, and we actually have a member of county council here, Anita Prezio. Thank you so much for being with us. I didn't want to bring, would you like me to bring you on? I didn't want to bring you on without, <laughs> without any warning. <laughs> You're there in a dark room. May I, may I bring you so that folks get to know you? I can't actually hear you, but I think you're shaking your head no. But sure. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, well, Caroline is shaking her head. Yes. Anyway, so this is Anita Prezio, who is the environmental and social justice star of the county council, um, not the most senior member, but a real uh, dynamo of trying to make good things happen. And we so appreciate your leadership there. Um, and uh, and Anita was not a scheduled speaker, but I'm very glad that you could join us and you may have some insights. And, and I don't understand everything about, you know, who makes the rules, who implements the rules, how all that happens. Um, the sausage making of government, but we are about to have a window into the sausage making of government from Caroline Mitchell, who uh, will share with us some of the constraints under which the Board of Health is operating. And um, I'll bring us back to just Caroline and uh, I will get your slides ready to go when you're ready for them. Oh. So what do I have to do to talk here? Let's see oh, if we can, can figure this out. 
If I can figure out the air quality regs, I should be able to figure this out, right? Can you hear me? Yeah, if you happen to have earbuds, they might be a little clearer, but we can hear you okay. So let me first start with an introduction that says that environmental regulation is one of the most difficult and frustrating areas for the practice of law. And the reason for that is that being a nation of laws, at least most, most of us are, we have constraints on how we pass any type of legislation that impairs someone's ability to make money. And that's called due process. There are constitutional cases and regulations all over the map. But basically, if we go back to the 70s, 1972, the Federal Water Pollution Control Act amendments came in. 1977, the Federal Clean Air Act amendments and amendments came in. All of those federal laws were passed by a group of legislators who were trading off, well, I want this. Well, I don't want that, but I want this. And so maybe you and I can get together and we're gonna say that the maximum fine is only 10,000 bucks. And then somebody says, no, I think it should be more like 1,000 bucks. Well, okay, since you want that, then I'll, I'll cave in and let's settle on 5,000. The first time I was privy to uh, environmental regulation making was as a member of a national study group on the lawnmower safety regulations. And I went as a lawyer with, a, with an engineering degree and I was appalled at what I heard because what I saw was Consumer Product Safety Commission on one hand, every lawnmower manufacturer in the United States, on the other hand, and everyone sitting down and saying, well, you know, we just can't put this safety equipment on our lawnmowers. It, it is so expensive, it's going to ruin our profits. Now, fast forward another 60 years, what do we have in Allegheny County? Well, we have the federal regulations and we have the EPA and the EPA sits ceilings on certain things of what local agencies like the Allegheny County Health Department can pass. We would love to pass a million dollar fine, but it's never going to be approved either by EPA or by the uh, state, which is subject to its own regulations. Now, I puzzled about this for the longest time and tried to find a little graph that would be indicative of what the problem is here, but I ended up writing one myself. So Marin can put this up on the screen as slide number one of the presentation. Basically what we have in Pennsylvania, we have the federal EPA telling us how much we can regulate and what we can regulate. And what we have is every regulation is going to be constrained by how much money is in the budget for that particular group. PennDOT, the DEP, they are all constrained by how much money do they have to study? How much staff do they have to look at the problem? Do they even want to look at the problem? I mean, do they even want to look at whether fracking should be allowed within a thousand feet of the school? Once the regulatory staff is formed to look at a particular problem, then we get into the budget issues. We have the House and the Senate. There are certain people in the Pennsylvania House and Senate who simply think it's unconstitutional as hell to regulate fracking or air pollution in any way whatsoever. And those legislators are in tension with the ones we just elected from Allegheny County. So my hat is off to Anita and Summer Lee and anyone who is willing to fight this fight because the big thing missing from this little handwritten, not very nicely done thing is a great big dollar sign that should be in that blank area there where we have industry and the industry paid lobbyists versus the citizens who are affected and the citizen action groups like GASP who are trying to get something done. Let's take a look back in the, in the uh, Bush and Reagan days. 
The EPA, our EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency that's supposed to be protecting us, came up with this brilliant idea that you should be able to uh, buy and sell pollution credits. So if you had a really good guy, a really good company who was doing a fair amount of polluting, but under the level, the level, they could trade off their pollution rights to somebody who was a really bad polluter, and then they could get money for it. Now, I thought that this was one of the most ridiculous things you ever heard in life, but this emission banking theory is still floating around. So let's take a look at the next slide. The next slide, according to me, is <laughs> one of the biggest problems that we had in this area, which is what was happening with U.S. Steel during the Christmas fire. Now, everyone was saying, well, Allegheny County Health Department needs to issue emergency alerts, and we need to be able to know these things. I couldn't agree with you more about citizens needing to know this. The problem is that we were constrained by regulations which defined what is an emergency. How many parts per million have to be emitted over that certain time period for it to qualify as the definition of an emergency? So here again, people who have common sense and are saying, the air stinks, it's horrible, I can't even go running, are up against regulations that were drafted by the circuitous method of the first poorly written slide, where if the Allegheny County Health Department decides to enforce a regulation beyond the scope of what is written, all that happens is we end up getting slammed in court as we have been quite recently. Let's take one of our one of our worst and most difficult cases, the Churchill asbestos case. If you're not familiar with that case, there was a contractor who was ripping stuff out of the Westinghouse facility and he was taking asbestos, an airborne, very hazardous particulate, and he was illegally carting it across town with poorly paid workers who had no idea that they were exposed to grievously carcinogenic dust. And he was caught thanks only to a very, very astute zoning code officer in Churchill who wondered what the heck was happening at the Westinghouse plant. Allegheny County Health Department fined that uh, named group the Churchill Development Company, uh, and it went to a hearing because just like a traffic ticket, if you get a fine for $1.7 million worth of asbestos air pollution, you have a right to a hearing, you have a right to remain silent, you have a right to bring witnesses in your defense, you have a right to extraordinarily highly paid lawyers, and there is a hearing process which decides, did you or did you not pollute? So the health department has a procedure for hearings that comports with due process. The procedure for hearings comporting with due process says you have to file an appellate bond for the amount of the fine uh, we're not going to just let you keep polluting while your case is wending its way to the Supreme Court in five years. So right now the case stalls because we, the Allegheny County Health Department, were viewed by the court system as not paying enough deference to the claim that this polluter didn't have the money immediately available to post a bond on the fine. Now, this happened in 2019. We're still litigating whether we have a right to a $1.7 million fine for air pollution and whether that polluter has the right to say, oh, well, we don't have the money, so we can't pay the fine. This is the kind of stuff that the regulatory agencies have put together 
to give due process to the polluters while the regulatory agencies such as Allegheny County Health Department have to abide by whatever the regs are that are on the books. So let's forward through this, Connie of Allegheny, the announcement of the Christmas fire at USX. We had a number of issues there as to why could we not do more to put the notices out that said it was an emergency, whatever people should do in the event of a, an air pollution emergency befuddles me because you can't exactly leave your house. You're probably supposed to just sit there and not go out of doors. Well, when they look at the definitions of what is a declared emergency, we get into difficulty because there's not enough pollutant coming off within the carefully constrained amounts of time that the regulations have set. Now, we go back to the first square. Who sets these regulations? Well, the regulations are drafted by interest groups, staff of the regulatory agency. We have excellent air quality staff. We have excellent plumbing staff, but we are subject to input from industry who comes and says, we can't possibly comply with the standards that's this strict because, and all of the evidence that is brought to the health board goes into a public comment document where anybody who wants to can submit public comment. At the end of the public comment period, the health department or the EPA or the Penn DEP, DER, whatever its name is now, have to take into account the public comments. Very often the public comments are, we simply can't afford to do that regulation. We cannot afford to um, have you be allowed to shut down our batteries if we're polluting too much because it's going to take so much of our profit away. And what will happen is that industry comes in and says, we can't afford to do what you want us to do. If the regulatory agency is fortunate enough to have groups like GASP and citizens to come in to say, look what this is doing to us. You can't let them get away with a weakening of the standard. The health department board then has a chance to weigh both sides and vote on whether the regulation should be passed. As an example, we had a regulation come up that was a, a plumbing regulation. The interesting fact was that if you read the plumbing re regulation one way, it, it would have forbidden people gathering rainwater off their roof to water their uh, plants and flowers with a recirculation system. And so when the testimony came in about that, two, two of us on the health board said, you can't stop people from using rainwater to, uh, to water their flowers. And that regulation was revised so that it became clear you were still allowed to do that. But that's the kind of give and take that happens when you're sitting on a board like the health board charged with making various local uh, rules for any kind of thing that, that deals with health, whether it's rats, whether it's air pollution, whether it's plumbing. And so then we fast forward, what's the next step? Let's assume that Allegheny County Health Department has a draft regulation. Let's assume it's gone out to public comment. Let's assume that people have come in and commented. And for most of the regulations, there are a lot of very good, very perceptive comments. And it's always lobbyists and industry versus human beings. So that regulation, which Allegheny County Health Board votes yay or nay, then has to go to county council. County council with its elected members has various committees to study this. One of the most frustrating things about being on the Allegheny County Health Board was that 
in certain instances, a proposed regulation would be unpopular with the elected members of county council. And so such a regulation can get stuck in a committee and that committee, as I'm sure Anita will tell you, needs to have a vote to send the regulation out to the floor where all of the council people can, can vote on it. If you can't get that regulation out of committee, maybe because the committee is controlled by people of a different political persuasion, maybe because nobody's really interested in it, for whatever re reason, all of the work of the health department is, is, is gone because the regulation can't get out of committee. Even if it does get out of committee, then what we have is Allegheny County Council can do what it wants, hold hearings, have a, uh, an up or down vote, listen to testimony. Back when fracking in the parks was an issue, tremendous public concern about that. The ultimate difficulty in a home rule uh, uh, county such as ours is that what county council passes isn't the last, isn't the last law on the subject. The last law on the subject is whether the county executive is going to veto whatever regulation came out. Now, if we go into the health department issues more, we have advisory committees. We have an air quality advisory committee. We have a plumbing quality advisory committee. But there's nothing in the regulations that say that the regulation recommendation by these specially formed committees has to be accepted or adopted. And so the, there have been situations where a regulation came out of an advisory committee and people said, well, I'm just not gonna listen to it. I don't like it. And, and there's nothing we can do about that unless we have a majority of the votes on council to say, well, this is not how it's done. So let's go to the next set of slides and we can look a little more at some of the issues. The next set of slides, I think, should be the agenda slide. Oh my, no, 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 no go back the agenda up. slide was before. Okay, well, there should be, uh, this is right, the well, agenda. maybe we are in, maybe we are in the next Yeah, slides. I think the slides may have been out of order because the ones here. Oh, the slides were, were the, 90 yeah. degrees reversed the last time I looked at them. Well, they got well, scrambled on the way. Here's your agenda, which we've been looking at for a while. Okay. Well, the agenda, as you can <laughs> see, because of due process, we get to um, have hearings in which the person accused of doing the dastardly act, the polluter or industry, is entitled to present all of the reasons why there should be no sanctions or penalty or fine. And in the case of U.S. Steel, was a very, very uh, long hearing. And the difficulty is that U.S. Steel was saying, well, you know, our equipment caught fire. As soon as we knew about it, we told the appropriate authorities and we did what we had to in order to contain it. We used a different type of gas to fire the batteries. We did a lot of flares to burn things off. And so after hearing all of their justifications for what they did, the health department staff had to go in and see whether what was being said was uh, in fact uh, acceptable as an excuse for not being fined. That type of investigation is done not by the health board, but by the staff who are experts in, God help them, air pollution, water pollution, all sorts of health problems. And one of the difficulties that was seen in the enforcement issues over the fire was the length of time that the pollutant has to be in the air to qualify as an emergency versus an alert. And each of those has different uh, characteristics as to what has to be done. So let's keep moving through this. I think the next slide should be what the health department officials were stating was the status of the Christmas fire. I think that's One of it. the difficulties is that this Christmas fire pointed out that some of the existing 
regulations that we have are not strong enough to be truly protective of the citizens who are living near that plant when everything caught on fire. So there's extensive testimony and analysis on the website as to what the difficulties were in doing what some of the environmentalists and community groups decided should be done. And I decided that I was gonna look at that myself and see what I could figure out as to whether in fact all of these things were uh, being accurately reported. And when I looked at what the health department staff had said, I found that everything which they were reporting to us was what was in the regulations, which we were not able to change, which we could not read to require the quote, emergency alert. The air pollution control law that was at issue has episode criteria for when an agency can uh, declare either the highest level, which is an emergency, the middle level, which is a warning, or the bottom level, which is an alert. And for an emergency, you can only declare the emergency if sulfur dioxide exceeds 0.8 parts per million over a 24 hour period. The exceedance in excess of eight parts per million was for less than one hour. So we could not declare an emergency that drops it back down to a warning. Now, do I personally think you should be able to declare an emergency? Well, if that regulation came in front of the board backed with technical data, it would certainly be possible to change that regulation. But the way that it was at the time of the Christmas fire, there was nothing anybody could do. So on January 8th of 2019, we have Liberty Monitor reporting more SO2 exceeding the allowable limits. But the episode criteria is telling us that if it exceeds 0.3 parts per million over six hours, uh, the only thing you can do is issue the alert if it's 0.3 or issue the warning if it's 0.6. Now, how does this affect the person in the community? You're sitting there, the air smells terrible, you don't want your kids to go out and you have all of these regulations. Well, what's the difference? Are you gonna not go to work because there's an emergency, but you are gonna go to work if it's merely an alert? These regulations, in my humble opinion, are just not very helpful to the average person in the community. So we get into what can the health department do? Well, the health department applies to have bigger and bigger and bigger fines. Well, every time there's a bigger and bigger and bigger fine, we have more and more highly paid lawyers working for industry telling us why the fine is so high that it is violative of due process, which is what the guy who did the asbestos dumping in Churchill was saying, well, 1.76 million, that's gonna destroy his profits. So we have courts. And what we should have in that first slide is we should have right in the middle of the slide, the right of appeal of anyone to a higher court. Now, what we have, sure which in, the appeals, what we have in the appeals process is judges who sit and say, well, you did violate the regulation and that's really terrible, but you're telling us that even with the reasonably available technology, you can't possibly get attainment at the level that you must. Now, let's look at the next handwritten slide, which is, we can get that up on the screen. Some of the Is this the things. right one, Caroline? Hello. This is, the, this is the Clean Air Act 1977. Right, you need to move to, yeah, move to the next slide. That's the, the same. The next slide should be number four. No, that is number four. This is, was your first slide. Then the slides are an article, are from an article. Hmm. 
Okay, so well, all right, the then I'll just tell you what the slides um, that disappeared said. Mary, click on the fourth one that's handwritten. Yeah, the handwritten one. Can you see four, the handwritten four, one? Just below number three, that's highlighted. You're on page three right now. I'm on page four right now. No, you're on page three. It's highlighted up there. Oh, the, the... I'm looking in the wrong. I, I had two versions of it. Okay, so Allegheny County Health Department made a policy decision three years ago that we did not want to just enter consent decrees that said, okay, polluter, we're going to give you another seven years to come up with what needs to be done. Now, the history of consent decrees is actually pretty depressing. Anytime there's a hard fought court case, the lawyers go in, the judge wants to settle, and the judge says, hey, why don't you guys go out and tell us a middle ground so you get half of what you want and the other side gets half of what they want. The poem goes, thus was justice ever spake in Rome to neither the entire loaf to each but half. And so every time we get even the big national groups, Delaware Valley Clean Air Council versus PennDOT, the EPA said there's auto emission, vehicular emission, air pollution. Philadelphia and Pittsburgh are both non-attainment areas under the air quality standards. And so PennDOT, you're gonna lose a hundred and some million dollars in road repair funds unless you pass regulations uh, for emission control of automobiles. Well, PennDOT says, uh, you know, we really don't know that, you know, we can do that. Um, the reason being that the legislature refused to give them the money to develop the program. And it went into court, PennDOT and Delaware Valley Clean Air Council with the assistance of EPA were suing PennDOT. So what does the judge do? The judge says, well, you know, if PennDOT is saying they don't have the money, you can't make them do something that's impossible because they don't have the money. Why didn't you sue everybody in the Pennsylvania legislature who was refusing to give the money? So what the judge ended up doing in that case was to say, we believe that the ozone and the particulates regs are too burdensome for industry. Uh, we don't believe we have jurisdiction as a court over the legislators who are refusing to enact the auto emission standards that the EPA says you have to have. So what we'll do is we'll do a consent decree. So after years of litigation, there's a consent decree, which in effect says, well, even though air quality in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia doesn't meet the federal standards, we don't think that it's possible to enact auto emission standards with the current status of the budget for PennDOT. So what we'll do is we'll, um, we'll let the polluters get away with it. We'll send it back to the drawing board and we'll have Pen dot sit down with the legislators and see what they can come up with. Now, you might say, well, that's like a waste of time and money. And it absolutely is, because these consent decrees, first of all, are binding on the parties for however long the judge writes into it, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. But the second thing is that you're never going to get what you want out of a consent decree. It's like somebody in an auto accident says, I have $100,000 worth of lost wages. And the insurance company says, no, you don't. You're only out of work for a month. So that's $12,000. Well, you're never going to get everything you want. The judge is going to say, OK, let's split it in half. And we'll give you $25,000. We'll give you $30,000. That's exactly what's going on in every one of these environmental consent decree cases. Let's take a look at the next one. The next one is even uh, more difficult because the next one is uh, the Clareton. Oh, keep going. The should be another. Well, the next this one should be the Clareton time. 1988 benzene particulate violations. 
that was the no, consent decree I don't have that slide. over whether U.S. Steel, oh no, that's the first slide, get rid of that, we don't want to look at that anymore. Oh. The Clareton 1988 consent decree was too much benzene, too many particulates, benzene being carcinogenic, that should have had an effect on people. U.S. Steel wanted a, uh, a permit to open two more batteries and GASP, thank heavens for GASP, says, Allegheny County Health Department, we want you to withhold the permits because this is terrible air quality. And the air quality is already non-attainment in this area. Well, U.S. Steel comes in and says, well, you know, the EPA standard of 3.9 parts per billion that's wrong. You know, we have scientists in our employ who say that you should be able to tolerate 12.8 parts per billion without getting cancer. So every time there's a standard on the books that was passed intending to regulate health, industry has a due process right to come in and bring their own consultants and their own tests and say, hey, the standard is wrong. And so the question can the uh, can Allegheny County withhold the two new battery permits? It goes into court. There's a consent decree, and the judge says, "Well, you know, best available technology isn't the law, thanks to certain presidential administrations, and so we we can't require them to do best available technology. We can only require them to do." reasonably available technology. Well, who defines reasonable? The answer is it's industry who defines reasonable. So what we end up having is consent decree after consent decree where a standard exists, the polluters come in and say, oops, too expensive, can't do that. Oh, bad economy, gonna cut into our profits too much or the ultimate threat, if you make us do this, it's going to cost us so much money that we're going to have to shut our plant. We're going to have to move down south to a non-union state. And so all of those things play out in front of one judge. And the judge says, well, you know, that consent decree that was entered 20 years ago, that's very difficult for them to comply with. And so what we're going to do is we're going to modify the consent decree and make it a lot less onerous for industry. This is what we've been facing for the last 30 years. You think you have a decent consent decree, industry comes in and says, oh, we can't do that anymore. It's simply too expensive. Or our batteries are so old that even our reasonably available technology isn't enough to keep those doors from leaking. So we simply can't do what you're asking us to do. It's out of the hands of the health department. Once we cite them, once we issue the fine, once the fine starts to go into the court system. And so fines are the way to go, except that the court can always look at it and say, well, you didn't have you don't have justification to find them $1.7 million. So as a depressing final slide, let's take a look at what has to be done to set these standards. Carnegie Mellon had a study. The next slide, if you yep. can find it, it. Uh, Marin is going to yep. be identification of likely PM 2.5 sources on days of elevated concentration a statistical approach in a non-attainment area. Well, I can tell you some of the background of that because I was working with the uh, civil engineers in that department. The first problem was that you have to figure out where to put your monitoring equipment, which was uh, a very tricky thing, a 1400 amp tapered, tapered element oscillating micro balance. And this thing is uh, at a certain height. And the city of Pittsburgh said, you're not allowed to build a building in Shenley Park to uh, put this thing up. And so we had to go to the zoning uh, people and say, look, this isn't going to be a building. This is going to be a temporary structure, i.e. A, um, a trailer that we're going to stick right next to that really expensive apartment building in Shenley Park. 
Well, the people in the apartment building were not happy that they would have to look at a trailer. And so it took quite some doing and quite some regulation and input from the city mayor's office to even get the right to stick the trailer in Shenley Park. Now it had to be in Shenley Park because you can't have this particular monitor right next to a heavily trafficked road because then what you're going to get is all kinds of uh, emission uh, pollutants coming in that are going to mess up your air quality PM 2.5 standards. So in order to figure out how to do this, it was almost a three-year process to just get the equipment in place to do the monitoring. And after the equipment is in place, the polluters, if you look at the next part of the slide, there's a lovely slide of who's all polluting, who was all polluting back in 2009. The Industries who are on the slide, if they are cited, are likely to go in and say, well, you know, look, I'm just that little dot in Allegheny up on the Allegheny River. And look at these great big black dots that are doing so much more pollution than we are. Every time we have a study like this, the study turns out to be of great help in the defense of the polluters saying, well, how are you gonna say that all of these pollutants are coming from our point source when in fact there are so many other ones out there and the winds are blowing in all of these directions. I and mean, the administration of the fines and penalties for this air pollution is an absolute nightmare. So I close by saying, what can we do about it? Well, what we can do about it is a couple things. One of them is you can elect the right people to your county council, to your state legislatures, to your federal government legislators, because they will have an input as to whether your environmental uh, agencies have the money to do a decent job to produce a standard that's going to stand up in the court system. The last thing you can do is elect judges who have an understanding of what the law requires and what is a permissible resolution of a case where we have a major pollution source who's been getting away with holy murder for the last three decades. And so we in Pennsylvania have done a good job trying to get our legislators to understand this. Unfortunately, nobody bothers to vote for judges, and that's where these decisions are being made to unseat and upset all of the consent decrees that everyone works so hard to arrive at. If anyone has questions, within the limit of my ability to not speak on behalf of the Allegheny County Health Department, I'm happy to talk about, uh, about questions. Marin, is it okay if I ask a question? Yes. Sure, definitely. ask a question. Yeah. Thanks. Um, uh, thank you. It was very informative. Um, I, at times I have signed up to speak, give testimony, and I didn't get a confirmation. Um, but one of the things that I most recently learned about was the Safer Technologies Alternatives Assessment. And I don't know if you know anything about it, but what I liked is it, it would require that sites like Clareton and many others in our area would assess whether they could use a better, safer chemical. And I, when I learned about it, this was through Union of Concerned Scientists. And when we checked, the, I think the 12 listed sites in our area, none of them have that requirement. So I wondered how can a citizen you know, what could I do to let community know and become aware of this? And, and this is tied to the risk management program. Um, or is it something that is decided at the government level that someone like myself wouldn't have access to? Well, the problem is that if there's a regulation on the book that says what 
has to be a, a permissible level of these things, you would have to get the regulation changed in order to force industry to do what you want it to do. And proposing a regulation change like that is, is massive because you have to have the data that says why it's necessary. Because if you don't have the data that says why it's necessary, the first judge who gets his or her hands on it is going to say, you are not permitted to pass a regulation that is unsupported by certain health data. Now, I'll give you an example, okay? City of Pittsburgh had a good city council. They realized that there were a lot of kids who had severe lead poisoning because old buildings very often use lead paint. So City of Pittsburgh Council decided they were going to pass a lead paint ordinance, which in effect said that if you were renting an apartment to someone, you had to test for the presence of lead paint. The only ones who were grandfathered in and allowed to kill children with, with lead paint were ones built prior to 1979. Well, when city council tried to pass part of the zoning code, which said all buildings older, uh, all buildings newer than 1979 have to test for lead paint and have to advise the tenant before you offer the lease, you have to say, hey, there's enough lead paint in there to like kill your kids. They got sued to hell and back by property owners who said, well, you know, you're gonna cut into our profits if you make us tell the tenant that there's a danger. And, and, and that ordinance was dropped. So you have the same problem with little small ordinances for one person landlords as you do for the big polluters that are putting out millions and millions of pounds a year of particulates. The problem is that the legislation on the books has to be related to safety data. Now, where do you get the money as a citizens group to, to get that safety data? I mean, the big universities have professors who can study it, but they don't have the money to be buying these expensive machinery and devices unless someone gives them a grant. So it all comes back to, is the legislature of Pennsylvania going to give enough grants to citizens and independent concerned scientists to actually study the problem and come up with a solution that can survive a court challenge? And in a lot of cases, the answer to that is, nope, it's not going to happen. I think gas probably has a much better grasp of what kind of money is available to do the testing and how they would prioritize that particular project instead of the other hundred that are on the books. But um, from a regulatory standpoint, we can't do a lot without the data and the data is expensive. So there we are. It's depressing, it's very depressing. And maybe Mr. Campbell has has something to say Thank about you. that, eh? Well, I, I was pinned here, but uh, the um, we we really don't in terms. Uh, I mean, this is not the kind of uh, typically that GASP you, does. We don't we don't do that kind of. Uh, that kind of analysis that you're that you're referring to, but but again, uh, it, we see how limited limited resources are prioritized, and I uh, you know I certainly resonate or uh, uh, resonate with uh, what your what what's been described as uh, a solution being proper elections <laughs> uh, from from the from municipal government all the way to uh, to state level and federal level. Uh, if I may, in Marin, okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Diane is uh, Diane, yeah, a, uh, borough council member right. in the town of Churchill. I, I'm, a, I'm thinking of uh, Ms. Priscio, who okay. is um, also an elected official here. <laughs> um, 
I just want to say something a little more optimistic, and I'll just give you a real quick little story. When um, I first heard about the whole fracking thing and got involved in the fracking thing, one of the most jarring things that happened to me was that I went to speak to our uh, representative to the state legislature, that is to the House and the General Assembly. And um, we, I started talking with him about fracking and he told me the story of how he learned about fracking. And that was that there were some nice people in Harrisburg who brought up buses uh, and put state legislators on the buses to take them out to see what the fracking site looked like. And he said, I don't know what all the fuss is. There's just these green canisters there. This is an important lesson, okay? As opposed to expensive legal action and the ability to do detailed chemical analysis, uh, you know, uh, Caroline made the point. It all starts with the people who make law. And don't think for a minute that you can't impact their thinking. Get them while they're home make an appointment to go to the office with a group of people, ask them what they know about the topic, ask them what they're going to do. Because when you get people one-on-one, -on -one, that is when they will hear you. Uh, and I don't want people to be discouraged in thinking that they can't have an impact. You may be surprised that the person that you're talking to may not have any idea that they don't know what they're talking about because someone has told them that this is the truth. So I just want to make that point. Uh, you know, community action, organizing, educating people where you are, where you live, growing that mass of people, getting a few people to speak with and for them, making that appointment with that state legislator, to go in and sit down and say, we need to know what you think about this, what you know about this, and this is what you need to know. So that's my two cents. Um, Mark had uh, something to say, so does my dog. Yeah, yeah, I wanna thank you, Carolyn, um, for talking through all these issues. And we've had conversations in the past and you know, I get frustrated about just like why not so you know you're you're very good at explaining why we can't do the thing that i really want to be able to do mm -hmm. um there's also i want to acknowledge like a a a um there's like a an expertise inequity here where we collectively many of us don't have the expertise to meaningfully question your assertions and so while I believe you, I also know that when talking to a range of experts as a filmmaker, you'll often get five different opinions about the exact same thing. And mm -hmm. so it, it gives me pause in terms of just like accepting wholesale the opinion of a single expert on the, and including the idea that like, as you've asserted, USD will bring in an expert and they'll tell the exact opposite of what the entire EPA has decided <laughs> is the right thing based on all the science. And so so, so I just want to kind of acknowledge that sort of it's difficult to ask you good questions because I'm not a lawyer with the incredible range of experiences that you have. Um, however, the, some of the patterns that I have encountered, I would love your opinion about, um, are that there are, it seems to be that there is a, a persistent pattern where the health department will kind of lean into a position that tends to benefit industry. For instance, when they just most recently, the um, health department um, asserted that at the, I'm going to put a little tweet here that, and I can even share my screen um, that we can just look at this Twitter thing. Um, there we go. Oops, nope, not that. The Twitter, there we go. There we go. This is what the health department said when US Steel had their major 
fire on the 4th of July. Um, it is believed that the power outage will either not affect or only minimally affect plant emissions. And this is what we saw that day in the brief cam. <laughs> and so it kind of, this seemed, it's, this feels like this is just another day in the relationship between the public and the health department where the public asserts a thing that is so absurd on its face based on just what a casual human being could observe plainly. You mean the health department? Sorry, the health department Assert is making assertions, yeah, that are so plainly deniable by or observably to be false by the general public as to be even absurd. That like, how on earth could you make this assertion that how can you have the belief that the power outage will either not affect or only minimally affect plant emissions? It seems like the only entity that this benefits is industry, when it would actually benefit the community, the public health, um, and, the, and the ability of the health department to get legislators to work on the laws if they didn't assert that this was not affecting or minimally affecting plant emissions. So I wonder if this is just you know, part one of my questions. Can you speak to what is going on in this dynamic that would cause the health department to make such an assertion that seems so absurd to a casual observer like myself? Well, I can't read the minds of the people that are the air pollution control experts. The difficulty, I think, is that my guess would be that the department employees were told that by U.S. Steel and believed it. And the question is, if U.S. Steel tells them this isn't going to affect us because we have a backup generator that's a propane generator that can run the pollution control equipment, we have no right to go in and say, okay, prove that to us. We can't get a search warrant to go in there and say, prove to us that without electricity for two hours, you are not going to be uh, violating the air quality standards. The staff doesn't have the legal authority to do that. Now, whether the staff is reporting exactly what U.S. Steel told them without investigating, that would be a very fair question. Like, why did you say that? What's your evidence that that is true? I would like to know that. But I have no information because for a topic to get to the Board of Health, it needs to be, shall we say, demanded by the citizens groups. And we just we had have a job, our, people. our latest meeting, and that was not brought up at all. I can't remember that being on a public agenda, and it certainly should have been. I mean, I agree with you, Mark. I mean, people who are regulators shouldn't take the face word of someone who's doing pollution, that this isn't going to affect anybody. I mean, that, that's very troubling to me that that would, um, that that would have, have taken place. Now, I have to say that because of health issues, I wasn't at the July meeting of the health board. And I don't recall hearing about that as anything that's an agenda item. Maybe that ought to be an agenda item. Can you get that onto the agenda and demand a, a public explanation of why that excuse was proffered? I suppose it's possible. Um, I tweeted it directly at the Allegheny Health Department. And so they were well aware of it. It got hundreds of views, um, lots of retweets. And it was, I believe that others may have talked about it during the um, Board of Health meetings following it. I don't know that they called out that specific issue directly in that mm, in those terms. Mm, mm. Um, but um, the I would I would I, I, I could put in a testimony. Um, I'm also reluctant to attend the health department board meetings because there's very little masking, if any, and there's no there seems to be no kind of care for vulnerable populations at the very health department meetings where we're supposed to go in and put in our concerns. So 
I'm, I'm not going to health department meetings presently because I don't see the Board of Health masked, and I don't see many in the audience masked, at least in a in enough that would give me comfort to attend in a closed space for hours on on end to report on a public health issue. Well, um, the, the thing that I would suggest is mm -hmm. that um, I'm just speculating as a private citizen here, okay, that if a group were to submit public comment asking for an explanation of the source of the scientific information supporting the claim that the power outage, quote, would have no effect, there should be an answer to that question. And even though Don Hopi is retired, somebody is likely to pick it up. Public source would pick it up because I, I'm appalled that something like that would be said without technical data to back it up. You know, let's say you have a scrubber. Let's say your scrubber needs so many watts of electric to run. Let's say that the electric goes out and they immediately power up the backup generator. In that case, there might be a technical explanation that says, because our backup generator started within 30 seconds of the shutdown, our pollution control technology was not interrupted. If that's what they're saying, then that's what they should be putting in the public statements as justification for what's going on. But we're not talking about just a little simple wet scrubber here. We're talking about some pretty massive power hungry pollution control equipment, which off the top of my head, I don't know what it is, but somebody knows what it is and somebody should, should answer that question. If I were you, I would get a hold of public source and I would get public source to do an article and I would create um, a demand for uh, an explanation uh, of that because that is not the way it's supposed to work. Cool. Um, may I ask a follow-up or I can get Chie go first sure, and I'll then be, I can ask well, a follow-up. I'm just gonna interject with my mm -hmm. hostly prerogative. Yeah. Um, you said citizens groups need to be raising this. Is there a reason that it needs, I mean, and it's great if GASP raises it and GASP may very well have raised it, but is there a reason it needs to be a group rather than a person like say Mark? Well, the problem is that there are many individuals who come and they have an issue that they wish to have dealt with. But when someone comes in and saying, I'm from Allegheny Clean Air, or I'm from GASP, or I'm from an organized group, there is much greater attention paid to that because there are no limits on what people can complain to the health department about. And so if we have someone who's complaining about a, an issue that affects only one family, it is probably not going to get as much attention as a complaint brought by a group who represents three, four hundred or a thousand or every person who lives in the Mon Valley from Braddock down to Squirrel Hill where we can't walk in the park. So, you know, theoretically, a one person complaint could certainly be as valid and important, but just because of the press of various complaints, the complaints by groups are given much more weight and taken much more seriously. Well, so the, the, I want to just add one sort of dimension here, which is if I was on a board of an institution that was making such assertions in the face of that kind of visual, I would be, I would be shocked and horrified as a board member that the institution that I was the board of was making such unbelievable assertions with plainly represented facts that are seem to be false on their face with a simple you know camera view and so i'm curious what would prevent you from raising that as a question as a board member at the next board meeting because you've seen this you seem to believe that it it does seem to be a concerning juxtaposition 
what prevents action being taken in that pattern? Well, I can tell you as a member of half a dozen boards that when a single board member raises an issue, it is very difficult to get a quorum of the board to agree to take a look at it. And I can tell you that in my experience on the health board, I have raised issues. Nothing ever becomes of my concern. Nothing becomes of my concern. You know, it is very difficult to, you know, be a voice crying in the wilderness, as it were. You know, and I, and I, mean, I can tell you that I'm on the health board and I've been on it since 2016. And I have spoken my mind and I've had fellow board members criticize me. Oh, well, uh, you know, you shouldn't be you shouldn't be doing that. Of course, that doesn't stop me because I'm an ACLU attorney at heart. Right. But um, I can tell you that it's a precarious situation if one person even myself, if one person, even myself, raises an issue, um, there is much more attention paid to issues that are raised by the organized groups. And I okay. will talk with you about this uh, at a later point in time to see if there's something that, that can be done because that's a, serious, that's a serious issue that you raised, Marsh. It really is a very serious issue. It's unfortunate so. that that tweet, Mark's return tweet, was not addressed by we the person in charge of their Twitter. My sense is that many government agencies get an overwhelming amount of social media stuff. I mean, there's newspaper articles and there's people sending tweets and people sending Facebook messages and people sending this and that. A letter on stationary of a group asking for an explanation directed to the head of the Board of Health and the director, the executive who's in charge of this might get more attention than a tweet. Like I personally don't do yeah. tweets. I don't even yeah. know how to do a tweet. And with As as well it should. Take notes, Patrick. <laughs> um, she uh, has patiently had her hand raised oh, my, for a little lady. while. So I'm going to bring Chie in and then we'll address some things that have gone by in the chat after that. And if somebody else wants to speak up, you can raise your hand or put things in the chat either way. Thanks so much um, for your presentation, Caroline. Uh, so I have two related questions. Um, the first is um, you've talked a lot about like enforcement based on technical standards, um, but my question is about how citizen complaints, um, either via phone or via web form, fig web form uh, figure into enforcement. Um, and I've heard that um, when you make a complaint, an air, like theoretically, an air inspector is supposed to come out and speak to the complainant and verify the complaint with two other people. Um, maybe that's not true anymore, but that like was um, something I've read about. Um, and no one has ever followed up with me when I made a complaint. So, well, what um, kind of complaint? What kind of complaint was like it? Like when I called on the on the phone line back when they were taking calls. Um, so just basically like how do citizens complaints work or figure into enforcement if at all um and then the second question is if you could shed some light um on how the health department uses the thousands of complaints recorded on the small pittsburgh app to shape their enforcement actions if at all um and the reason i ask this question is because i was at a health department meeting in 2018 or 2019 um when the former deputy director jim kelly openly disparaged the use of the small pittsburgh app and said that the data was compromised because and people were filing lots of erroneous and false reports um and i actually along with the research team at Pitt, looked at over 7,000 um uh, small pittsburgh complaints and we coded them painstakingly and we found that very few of them seemed like they were erroneous or compromised. Um, so yeah, and I can restate those two questions. Well, see, he, here's the problem, okay? As I understand how the enforcement arm of the health department works, we have air quality trained technical people 
who deal with issues of whether there are exceedances of any of the forbidden chemicals. So when complaints come in, what their algorithm is, I mean, do they have to have two? Do they have to have 10? Do they have to have exceeds 0.8 parts per million? How they utilize their labor force to go out into the field is not something that I know, and it's not something that the health board has the ability to change or criticize unless we had a body of complaints saying the inspectors in Liberty are refusing to listen to people. I mean, what the health board does is not run the day-to-day -day operations. That's the executive director, the air quality director, the plumbing inspectors, the health people. The board looks at issues of do the regulations which are being proposed fit within the legal guidelines that would allow us to pass them. We don't typically get involved with, oh, that plumber is cheating and then the plumbing inspector didn't give him uh, a license suspension. We can't possibly as a board get involved in monitoring and supervising what the people who are the employees do because who would want to be on a board? I mean, it's like an unpaid job if you have to get into those details. So in answer to your question of why are they ignoring tweets and why are they ignoring smell Pittsburgh? That is a question that would have to be answered by the person who's in charge of the air quality program. And if you say that Mr. Kelly said that he had a technical concern that the Smell Pittsburgh reports were not valid, that's something that should be discussed and brought to the health board as an enforcement issue. Like here are complaints, it's exceeding 0.6, it's exceeding 0.3. It's more than this or that in six hours, eight hours, 12 hours, 24 hours. Why aren't 24 complaints of this being dealt with? And if they are being dealt with, are they being dealt with adequately? So if you say, well, I called back in 2019 and nobody got back to me, I have no ability to look at that or investigate it. I have no answer for you as to why whoever received these emailed or text or phone complaints did nothing. But I can tell you that the staff who is in the air quality program have protocols for what they do in response to a complaint. And so what you need to find out is what are those protocols and are they adequate? You know, if there is data coming in from Liberty that shows that Allegheny County should be out there issuing fines and they're not, we need to know that. But who are the people that can give the data to begin such an investigation? The answer is the people that are filing the citizen complaints in the first place. Because by the time it gets to the health board at a meeting, which is four, six, eight months later, all we know is what does the staff in charge of that project report as the response to a complaint. So I have no, I have no way to answer your question. So my first question, I'm sorry if it wasn't totally clear the way I phrased it, was I'm, I'm kind of more interested in like the legal aspect of how citizen complaints are counted for enforcement. Can you talk well, about that no at all? Pro there's no protocol on it. There's no, okay. If somebody comes in and says there's a Christmas fire that just blew out two batteries, they're going to be out there in full force. If someone calls and says, my kid is getting sick from asthma and I'm upset, they're not going to go out in full force. I mean, there's just a broad bandwidth of how serious a complaint is viewed. And who's in charge of making that decision? Presumably the air quality staff is. What's their protocol for assessing the seriousness of a violation? They're gonna be looking at what their monitors are reporting. 
Uh, they're also going to be looking, I would think, at the Smell Pittsburgh app, but um, I have no answer for your question. Maybe Mark knows more about why it is perceived by Allegheny County Health Department air quality people that the Smell Pittsburgh app was not generating results that were taken at face value by them. Do you, do you know why that is, Mark? What was I believe criticism? that, yeah, there is, um, periodically, there are sort of peculiar reports that emerge, like from the middle of Clareton Coke Works during an incident that say green, everything smells fine, when the entire region is reporting red, orange, yellow. And so I think that's a, it's an unfortunate, it's a, actually deeply disappointing misunderstanding of crowdsourced data by the health department to assert that that information is not admissible as reasonable evidence of a problem. Because it's very easy to see that 100 or 300 reports were submitted that day, almost certainly by different people, because you'd have to spend a lot of your day just driving all over the region, mm -hmm. you know, because the app doesn't let you falsely submit. It, it only lets you, like, you can falsely submit and make a lie if you drive around all day and do it, but what's the chance that on a day when SO2 levels are high and H2S levels are high and particles are high, that 300 people just randomly decided to submit multiple reports of problems? So I think that it's a, it's that kind of, of feedback we get from the health department to hear, and I was at one or two of those meetings, Chie, where I heard that kind of thing, and in real time in the meeting, I recall going through the data and assessing like how many, what was the number? It was it was very easy to tell how many were like level one versus level two, three, four, and five. Anyway, these sort of were, these analyses were very easy to assess, but I think that um, it was an unfortunate and perhaps disturbing discounting of the nature of crowdsourced data under those circumstances. That they did, they, would, did they tell you why they were refusing to take the, the crowdsourced data? Did they think it, everybody was making phony reports or what? I think it was just sort of a casual dismissal. It wasn't like a formal answer to an inquiry. It was just like, oh, well, there's some reports that are not valid. And so we just can't use that data. When in actuality, you get a lot more data from the smell Pittsburgh reports from a lot more areas where things are happening. And then if you just interpret it properly, you might regard reasonably three or four smell Pittsburgh reports are equivalent to one ACHD submission or 10 smell Pittsburgh reports are equivalent to one ACHD you know, submission. But it's a, there's an algorithmic process I think that needs to happen where as the health department might just say, well, it's not our formal process. And so we completely disregard that information on a formal basis, we can't regulate by it. When in actuality, they're gonna spend a lot of money looking at how to predict when smells or inversions are gonna happen and all this stuff. All that data is already available in Purple Airs, Smell Pittsburgh, Plume PGH, and it's and they're gonna run one another study for another three or four or five years to assess when they can predict this stuff. I have even a blog about it, about how to predict it mm. yourself. Like there's mm. all this kind of information. I don't know, Chia, if that zeroes in at all, I'll stop. Well, I have one piece of good news for you. Hmm. A very prominent environmental scientist who's currently at um, Syracuse, who is very, very uh, involved in data analysis for air pollution control, is going to be coming back to Pittsburgh and spending half a year at Carnegie Mellon, half a year at Syracuse. And a project like that is something that would be very, very interesting and very, very important because, you know, I'm sitting here and one of my worst courses, I'll tell you that right now, the course I hated the most, momentum mass and air transport of particulate matters because there's like a zillion variables, the temperature, the wind, the plume, the stack height, the this, the that. I mean, it was like a nightmare of a course. So, Let's assume that somebody says, oh, we can't use smell Pittsburgh. And somebody else says, well, why? And the person on the receiving end of the question says, well, we just, we're just not going to. That's arbitrary and capricious, and it's not based on science. Now, do they have some, some hidden scientist somewhere in Antarctica who says, 
oh, you can't use that particular monitoring system. I mean, I'd like to understand the technical basis for anybody saying that the smell Pittsburgh data is not something that can be relied on. And, and maybe, maybe there's some industrial source that is funding some study that says that smell Pittsburgh isn't reliable. Well, if there is, I'd like to know about it, but we need, we need to get answers to this. I mean, this is, this is something where scientifically smell Pittsburgh monitors are either accurate or they're not accurate. And if somebody's saying they're not accurate and we're going to ignore them, then what's the data to support that? And if someone else is saying, well, it's just too much trouble, that's arbitrary and capricious and you shouldn't be doing that. And I don't have the answers to that right now. So. All right. Um, thank you, Caroline. Uh, yep, I might get turned off the health board, but hey, you know, yeah, it's another yeah, yeah. day. It's I want to go day. back uh, to you know. I will things. say that I've taken public positions that people have really disagreed with, mm -hmm. and nobody has thrown me off the health board yet. So, I think I'm safe for another five months <laughs> until the next county executive wins the Democratic primary. So, put that on your schedule, people. You need to have a county executive who understands this and is willing to do the right thing. We need to get a really good candidate up. There are um, a few, there are a few who- are and there a few already stepped up? Pardon? Are there a few that have already stepped up? The word that I'm hearing on the street is Sarah in Amarado. Mm -hmm. I'm also hearing that of course, Corey O'Connor wants to keep his current appointed position as county controller. And I'm also hearing a couple names that are like out in left field of people who might be interested, but don't have the money and don't have the organization behind them. Um, it would mm -hmm. be a useful thing to start saying, what's your environmental platform? If you in fact have one at all. So mm -hmm. I have my personal opinions of who would be the best woman for the job. That's all I'll say. <laughs> Marin, there was one other little yes. parallel I wanted to draw real fast that I did a little bit of research into the Tonawanda Coke plant in New York that was shut down by the New York DEP for violations that it kept on violating. And, you know, and, and they shut it down. It's shut down. The DEP said, sorry, it's the end of our rope. You're done. And Yay I them. what's that? Yay yeah, them. Yeah, they just did it. And it seems that in, in doing a little bit of a comparative analysis, I talked to some of the advocates and activists who were working on Tonawanda and went through some detailed assessment of Claritin versus Tonawanda. And my sense is that there were some behaviors that were regarded by Tonawanda as, as criminal that there was like some criminal proceeding or something that happened against one mm. of the owners that that was that they were they had misreported their benzene emissions significantly um mm. but but they were also hiding emissions and health department has has put in their documentation on some of these violations that there were people at US Steel hiding emissions in real time like obfuscating emission sources at the coke plants with some material but that wasn't charged as a crime or as a personal criminal thing it was just like rolled into their penalty assessment um but it seems to me that us steel has a much sort of more egregious continuous violation track record compared to tonawanda on a scale that far exceeds tonawanda and why is it then that tonawanda was shut down when the Clareton Coke Works is not shut down, and it seems to be based on your assessment today, a severe, like an extraordinary impossibility that the health department could even get close to shutting them down, let alone meaningfully regulate them. Well, here's a question, Mark. How long ago did the data come in 
that there was falsification of the test results. Oh, I think it was, I, I would, I think it was within about 10 years. Oh. Because the way I understand it is the following. If it is a data falsification of a required federal standard, the U.S. Attorney's Office is the one who investigates any complaint brought by a regulatory agency that it has found evidence of falsification. Because there are statutes on the books that say that you are obstructing justice, a great term, right? You're obstructing justice if there's deliberate falsification of test reports made to a government agency, you know, like OSHA, Fair Labor Standards, all the people that get fined for lying about overtime to the pizza companies. If there is evidence in the possession of a regulatory agency like Allegheny County Health Department that some person has falsified data, that is criminal. It's local but it's also a violation of the state regs. And so it is Attorney General Josh Shapiro who's going to be investigating that. Now I will say just globally that if I had a choice between going to a state attorney general on a violation of a state environmental regulation that was enforced by a local agency, I would always choose to go to the state attorney general and not to a local district attorney for many reasons. Local district attorneys sometimes have staff who don't understand the magnitude of a falsification like that, but that is absolute obstruction of justice. And it's uh, all kinds of crimes in the Pennsylvania Crimes Code that would be uh, an individual prosecution of the agent of the industry who employed that person. But the problem is that our state legislature has pretty tight statutes of limitations. Like if you discover a theft, you must report the theft within one year of your learning of it, or you can't prosecute for a million dollar embezzlement. There's a separate statute of limitations on an obstruction of justice, failure to provide accurate information to government officials. But you would have to have someone come and say, here is a report. We can prove it's false because of A, B, C, and D. And the person who committed it is X, who is in the employ of Y. And so you would start a criminal prosecution of the person who falsified that data. I mean, that would be a no brainer. I didn't spend three years in the district attorney's office for nothing. I mean, they would take a complaint like that seriously. They would subpoena documents. They would do search warrants for documents and they would get the ball rolling. Why no one at the health department, was that under Bruce Dixon or was that under Karen Hacker or was it under uh, Deborah? Our current, our current one, because you would have to figure out who was the executive director who was failing to cause that to be treated as a, as a criminal mm -hmm. violation. I, uh, I don't recall, and I don't know, like, I just remember vaguely that there was like some, somebody like trying to put some stuff to hide a thing. And that was a note in the violation notice. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know that there was any data misreported. I have seen some of the information about when the health department when the health department receives a notice from like U.S. Steel for like when that Fourth of July fire happened. That there was like scarce information in the in their standard form about like what was the cause of the thing, you know. And and you know it, it calls to question if you can handle a, a total site power outage, why can't you handle a a planned hot idle? to bring yourself into compliance, it's just sort of like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you know, the additional problem is let's point some fingers at the legislature too, because we have a quote, state right to know law, but the state right to know law 
has exceptions in the law for anything that is conceivably related to any pending criminal or regulatory action. And in fact, you can't discover what's in DEP's files until after DEP issues the citation. And so we citizens can't know ahead of time who is failing to enforce. And then you get into the Pennsylvania Whistleblower Act. And the Pennsylvania Whistleblower Act is cleverly mm -hmm. constructed, like the wiretap law, to make it very difficult to find people that are doing criminal things in the state. The whistleblower law says, well, you are only protected as a whistleblower if it is your job duty to report the bad thing. And so that was put into effect by a Republican controlled legislature who did not want people like us reporting things. You know, so you have some it's poor bonkers. soul whose job is as a janitor and he sees falsification of uh, air quality stuff. And he says, well, okay, I'm gonna report it and then I'm gonna lose my job and then I'm gonna be blackballed and nobody will ever harm me again. Because if I report it as a whistleblower, um, I'm not protected because my job as janitor does not include monitoring air quality. So. The, the decks are stacked against mm. the people who are inclined to do the right thing, but, you know, at, at great personal cost. And that's uh. why, you know, bring back Joe Hill, unions forever. The only defense of a person in that situation is if the union comes in and says, you can't fire that janitor because he's reporting criminal activity. Because without union protection, you're dead. You're absolutely dead. Mm. John Fetterman is right. Without the unions, the workers are going to be in a world of hurt to, to, for doing the right thing. So, well, that uh, I have to talk to you about something offline with a recent whistleblower thing. Um, but uh, back into the back into the text here. Um, and I'm going to leave Mark up just because he's Mark. <laughs> always has good things to say. Always has useful things to say. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, it, uh, Steve Hepler, who is here, by the way, from the D DEP, um, is with us, is uh, pointed out that Erie Coke was, in fact, shut down. Uh, DEP action was part of that, although city action also was very important, I think, in the end. Mm. I just looked up and I threw a link in to an article from Go Erie um, that uh, DEP came down on them very hard about air uh, enforcement. And ultimately, they were shut down right after the city ordered them to stop discharging wastewater into the river. And so um, river, lake, whatever they were discharging into. Um, uh, into the city's sanitary system, rather. Okay. And uh, so there were a lot, they were shut down in December 2019. Because so often there's a lot of um, citizen complaints about, um, about emissions, whether they be air or water, but it always seems to be economic factors. Shenango Coke shut down because of economic factors. Um, U.S. Steel would takes action only based on economic factors, fines and markets and the non-union situation down in Alabama or wherever they're setting up their much cleaner Coke facility. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as, as you alluded to earlier, Carolyn, going to non-union places down south. Um, so uh, I wanted to um, not ignore all the things that have gone by in the chat. <laughs> and I guess I'll go in reverse order just because then topics will stay um, closer to where we are. Um, uh, so uh, GA pointed out that Jim Kelly, who, who was the um, AIR program, leader who was 
uh, disparaging uh, smell Pittsburgh reports, which are admittedly subjective, but people I don't think are just making them up for the hell of it. Why would they? Um, an irony is that he was advocating that people report on Allegheny County's own web form, which is also just as crowdsourced and just as subjective. So I guess the overwhelm was a big part of the problem. Um, Mark posted a link that um, talks about how uh, emission events or emission impacts can be uh, predicted. Um, and we have a lot of uh, uh, predictions which go into those episodic regulations, which still aren't doing the trick. So probably means that the companies need to be forced somehow, that's you guys, Caroline, forced to, or the department, the county needs to force them to make stronger plans because they're not working. Mm -hmm. Um uh, da, 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 da. and um, yes, and Steve again, uh, who is speaking from being in the know, uh, suggests submitting comments during a meeting of the advisory committee and ask for a presentation uh, or report in those meetings on how complaints are handled handled mm. um and that's where the groups the citizen groups as caroline pointed out are very important because they speak for so many people so they are more listened to um patrick posted a couple of very relevant blogs on the gasp website I, again go to the gasp website right there on the home page is uh a few blog entries and uh blog against smog uh if you click on any of them, you can go to the blog against smog. Um, uh, and um, Melanie pointed out that the kind of disinformation that Mark was referring to in his tweet uh, deters community members from organizing and taking uh, action around climate or environmental justice um, because the people believe what U.S. Steel tells them. Um, there's, the Clareton School District has ranked in the lowest fifth percentile for over 40 years. Four decades of misinformed citizens make the Mon Valley a difficult task. Uh, Melanie's father ran for mayor three times, and it was rumored that votes were shaved, which is why industry supporting mayors seem to be the way around here. So the mayors toe the line because industry helps get them into office. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, and uh, Alexandra had a great question. Um, is there a group that monitors judicial data? And if so, do they send out this information to voters prior to you, elections? You would be astonished at how difficult it is to find which particular judge authored which particular opinion. Mm. Um, you need to be able to go on to the court website and pull the information of who the author of an opinion was. And usually it's a panel opinion, which is either three judges or nine judges. Mm -hmm. So you don't know who's saying what. The difficulty for the Bar Association is that I was on the Judiciary Committee for the local Bar Association and lawyers from certain firms were absolutely terrified to give a recommendation that said that so-and-so is a very bad candidate for judge. Mm -hmm. one, of, one of my last acts as a member of the Judiciary Committee was that I caught a judicial candidate issuing false federal subpoenas. And I reported that person to the Judiciary Committee. And I called a few of my friends who did a lot of law practice. And my friend said, you know, that happened to me too in a case where that person did it. When that person came before the Judiciary Committee for a lifetime appointment, the Judiciary Committee voted not qualified, not recommended. 
That person was nevertheless appointed to a lifetime federal judgeship. So you say, um, what can we do to monitor these judges? It is very difficult, very difficult. The federal system is straight political appointments. If you're George Bush's tennis partner, like Clarence Thomas was, you get judicial appointments. So it's a system that is difficult to monitor and it is difficult to correct unless you vote at the ballot box for the state court judges who are subject to election every X number of years. So, I mean, it's a, it's a depressing system. I've been in it for almost 50 years and it's depressing. What can I say? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, thanks very much for giving us a window. For all well, of this depression, right? Well, we, we thought we were going to be a lot more depressed after Tuesday night than we are. That's right. And we're so not, you're making we're up for it. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> and I think I just sent you the link to the new Georgia project so that we can get Senator Warnock back in office. Yeah, yeah. Um, Stephen wonders whether um, the health department staff can contact those who submit Snell Pittsburgh reports uh, since it's, um, and, and then they can, uh, they would be able to figure out how qualified those people were. It seems like there should be a box to click if you're a, a smoke reader. Um, and then those should rocket to the top of the list. You know, here's um, an idea. Mark, yeah. Here's an idea. There is no current enforcement based on Smell Pittsburgh. So it is not one of the categories where you can be denied access to the data because there's some investigation pending. It sounds to me like a right to know request is in order, it has to be very well thought out because right to know requests have a very limited appeal time. Mm. The appeal for denial of a right to know request, having been on the receiving end of many of them myself, um, denials that is, is that you have about 10 days to file in the uh, Court of Common Pleas of Allegheny County. And the judges there take those quite seriously because what I found happened is that um, the government agency has a staff. I'm not saying this will happen. I'm saying I have seen it happen in other agencies. The government agency has a staff and they're busy. And they look at a right to know, like my last one that filed that had 19 categories of zoning records. And um, I get this like two page outline, uh, denied, 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 denied. And um, none of the denials are justified. So you go in and you file an appeal and you talk to a judge. Judge, you know, they were just too lazy to look at their own records because record A says that record B exists and their response to the record B request is that the thing doesn't exist. Well, then how did you reference it in your first answer? I mean, you cannot trust that an overworked government employee is going to be telling you the truth. So you need to verify everything they say. So, and then you get in front of a judge who has to stand for election and you go in and you say, I wanted this publicly available data and they didn't give it to me. And you're likely to get it. You're likely to get it. But your request has to be very specific, very well worded and thought out. And be prepared that if you don't get what you think exists, you have to be prepared to go straight into court, which is there's boilerplate how to file how to file appeals of you know right to know actions. And if it's not against the health board, I can help you with how you should construct it and what you can do to appeal it. But um, you know that's that's the way to get your hands on this data. I mean that's the only way to get your hands on this data. So um, I was I actually did a when in my early days of of fiddling with air stuff I did submit a right to know request for smell pits right not smell Pittsburgh but for the smell complaints into the health department and they gave me a giant spreadsheet 
filled with all kinds of very personal information about all these people who had submitted these uh, these smell reports. And it was very elucidating. And it, it, it revealed to me how many days regularly the health department would wait after a smell complaint had come in to go and explore. It's sort of like, oh, they're just assuming that like the fire burns for weeks on end. And so coming back, you know, four days after three, two days, the next day after an inversion, that there's still going to be some relevant, meaningful mm -hmm. action they mm -hmm. can take at that time. And then they will go there and ask three or four people, did you, do you smell something? Like, oh, you know, and then if the answer is no, then that's not an issue. And the case is closed. Nowadays, you submit a smell report Right. They'll just send you a note that says, here are the great things we're doing about the air quality and your case is closed. Well, you need the protocol, I would think. What is the protocol for determining when to send someone to the field? Is the protocol such that the severity of the offense charged makes the person get out there faster? I mean, for instance, there's a lot of complaints about recreational fires. Oh, Lord, the recreational fire complaints come rolling in right about this time of year because it's fall and everybody wants a recreational fire. And the complaints are um, that nobody ever bothers to investigate. Well, the municipal police just don't have any patience for recreational fires. And so when there's a recreational fire complaint on an air quality action day, there's a recreational fire. The municipal police sit there for a week and then they go out and somebody says, oh, my kid wanted marshmallows. Oh, okay, you know, I, I, it, it, there are just some complaints that are ignored, even though on the books it says they're supposed to be investigated and enforced. I mean, some woman, who has asthma living next to a recreational fire burner who is not cooking pizza, but is just burning good smelling smoke has every right to have that ordinance enforced. And it could well be that with enough people on county council, there could be a public hearing and there are rules on how you can have a public hearing, how many people have to petition, how many people have to show up County Council, in, in my days of observing them, hated public hearings because when enough people promised that they would show up, I mean, they were there until midnight on some of these public hearings. And so, you know, you, you really ought to like suspend the, this is the Girl Scout that got the award stuff and put the public hearing at the beginning and let all of the nice award people move to like the next week. I mean, I don't know who sets their schedule, but it's 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 very cockamamie to have an hour taken up with, we are going to recognize so-and-so's pizza parlor for being in existence for 30 years and let all the people who want to comment on matters of public concern wait until nine o'clock at night. I mean, that's what was done. If you remember the fracking in the parks, in the parks stuff, the fracking in the park stuff, you know, the, the hearings were starting like at like nine o'clock at night. So maybe someone who's on county council could give us some insight of how we could get the attention of county council. Bring... Unfortunately, Anita had to leave. Oh yeah, well, so good, we can talk about it. Just a few minutes ago, but she was <laughs> yeah. very- Yeah, I mean, if you, have, if you have a majority on county council, there are protocols of how to get a public issue to a public hearing, which is how they managed to get the fracking in the parks issue brought up and have such a brouhaha. You know, we ought to just think about this in a little mm -hmm. private meeting on Marin's back deck one of these days. <laughs> right, yes. Mark? You right. bet. I'm down. Yeah, yeah. I and so I so appreciate your uh, your willingness to just chat candidly about these things. It's such a revelatory, like essential part of the dialogue, and I yeah. can't thank you enough. Um, and well, there's a whole history of government agencies just not being willing or able to enforce the laws that are put on the books, and mm -hmm. unless people yell and scream and threaten to unelect people, uh, nothing is going to change nothing is going to change. So I would love to help to get some people unelected. So. Yeah. Yep. 
Yep, and get somebody really good into the county executive position next year. Because that is going to be absolutely it, critical because one. remember, whoever you put in has veto power. Yep, and and um, and the know, parks, the parks, um, the parks victory. I want to say was a tremendous demonstration of people power because there was a victory with, by vote of the county council. And then Fitzgerald vetoed it. And so many people came out making so many good points at that hearing where you're allowed to wait until late at night that some of the county council members, and also there was canvassing, getting, door knocking, getting people to make calls to their representatives. Um, several of them changed their vote and it was enough to override the veto. And that was a really strong showing. And it, it was one of these things that gives you hope. Uh, not just the old soft soap. Um, there is, it was the fear of not getting elected again. Right, which, yeah, because they, even one guy who said, I don't think this is the best way to go about it, but my constituency clearly wants it. I got so many calls. And other people were, one guy we didn't know which way he was going to vote until the end of the meeting. And and he said, in, until the end of his remarks, because he, he gave a long little speech about something at the end. And... And then finally he said his vote and everybody breathed a huge sigh of relief because I think we only did it by one vote. Um, while most of us are still here, I wanted to, and, and Mark, thank you for the uh, shout out. Um, and Linda, if you'd like to say anything about it. Um, also, we've had a pretty high powered um, attendee list here with all kinds of policymakers and um, medical people and gas people and Linda Wigington, who is the uh, head of the Rockus effort, Rockus is reducing outdoor contaminants in indoor spaces, and it's an amazing um, indoor and outdoor household air monitoring program where you volunteer to join a cohort. You they loan you a whole raffle raft of of instruments for three weeks. Um, you take some notes. Um, and on what's going on that affects them. And uh, and they're doing, so this is citizen science where you're not having to do the science yourself. You're just taking the observations, learning about your own air, what you can do to affect it. And, um, and Linda, would you like to say anything more about that? And yeah, also just... contributing to, uh, where'd you go? There you are, I'm trying to add spotlight and contribute to science about how this stuff works and what is happening in our region. A great summary, Marin. Um, the key thing is it's our cohorts are virtual now. And mm -hmm. we also do um, have a lot of meetings within the, it's gonna be this coming cohorts over Christmas, like the first one you were in, Marin. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, you can take a break if you need to, but. Uh, monitoring over Christmas can be pretty relevant because that's sometimes when there's more pollution out cooking. there. But anyway, it, well, more cooking, but also Inside. more outside pollution. Yeah. Flareton, anyway. So um, uh, it is free, and um, we're we'd be doing the introductory webinar this Thursday or Friday, and that's where you just find out no commitment. You just find out if you're interested in participating, and then. Um, uh, then you, you decide to commit right after that introductory webinar. We'll be starting at December 1st. So that's the process. But we absolutely welcome folks to uh, uh, just find out more about it first and know that you don't, you know, you make the choice after. Yeah, that's, um, it's, it's a really wonderful program. Very educational for the participants and contributory to a big citizen science project. Um, and Linda has come to sustainability salons Many times. past autumns to both attract people, recruit people into it, but also to present some of the results that they've found. Um, yeah, a key part of it is helping people figure out uh, what interventions they can take. Our focus is on particles and uh, we'll loan some equipment. We also have some interventions that we can uh, co-share on so it um, um, it could really be a benefit Barbara Litt has been involved for quite a long time I don't know if she's off now but uh, 
we've actually gotten a lot of recruits from people in the salon. So we really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, so thanks for the pl I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, Linda. Still enjoying it. Yep. There's, we're just having a, all kinds of folks participating. Yeah, and I, I went and um, uh, Mark was doing a bulk order of a bunch of purple air monitors. So I, I gave back all the other stuff, but I now have purple air monitor here um, and can keep tabs. And, and a lot of it, I do have a, um, I burn wood in this big stone thing which is called a masonry heater. And it's a very clean and efficient way to burn wood. Um, and I've used the, I have a purple air monitor on my front porch for the purpose of making sure that it's clean. So, and I have found that yes, it is very clean. What I see locally is my neighbor's wood stove and my other neighbor's fireplace and my neighbor's grill. And um, uh, so that when, when it's something that isn't in the general region, which of course we are also affected by. Um, Mark, you're still on. Do you want to say your, that question about uh, EJ laws or regulations? Oh, I don't have an answer to Neil's thing. Oh, that I was Neil's to... thing. Oh, that was Neil's question. Okay, Neil asked yeah. another uh, high powered presence um, currently cooking our dinner. Uh, <laughs> um, Neil is an atmospheric chemist and pollution expert um, uh, Carnegie Mellon, who was involved with the super site that uh, Caroline was talking about before, asks, are there any local, state, or federal environmental justice laws or regulations that apply? Do you want to just say it, Neil? Do you want to come on, Neil? No. OK. Um, sure, whatever. Um, you know, I was just wondering, because we have legal experts here, if there's any, the, the basic idea is that, that there's an obvious EJ issue that that we're often focused on, which is people living in Clariton and in general uh, disadvantaged people live closer to pollution sources and are exposed to higher concentrations of pollutants. That's that's kind of EJ 101. But there's another thing, which is our best understanding of the damages from air pollution are that they the, the, the geeky term is they multiply baseline risk. So if I get exposed to a certain level of pollution, um, I might increase my risk of dying by 10%. Or, well, so it actually 10 micrograms per cubic meter of, of PM 2.5 increases your risk of death by about 1%. It, incre it multiplies your baseline risk by 1%. So, and it, it's associated with systemic inflammation and systemic stress. And there's abundant evidence that uh, members of disadvantaged communities have higher baseline risk for all kinds of reasons. And so even the same plain vanilla pollution level across Allegheny County is going to go and pick on people who are, in, who are disadvantaged. And so if there's any, and, and I actually strongly suspect that I was just chatting with Karen Clay and an environmental economist at CMU about this just like the other day, but I strongly suspect if we work the numbers that that winds up with a bigger effect. So that it's no doubt people living close to polluting sources is a big deal, but but just communities that are that are in under stress being exposed to pollution, I think, is a bigger deal yet. Uh, and so, if there are if there are EJ laws, that would mean if we can demonstrate that, and I think we can, that would mean that that you wouldn't have to to get this prove this sort of uh, it's not double jeopardy, right? But you wouldn't have to say, oh, my community is exposed to higher levels of pollution. To it to to um, to to invoke whatever regulation or law was in place, you would just have to be able to show my community has higher baseline risk, and then the rest of of potential enforcement would come into play. And so, essentially, everybody in a community who has higher baseline risk has uh, I, I'm not remotely an attorney, but but has a uh, has has some. Um, 
what's the what's the legal term but has, has is is standing uh, standing thank you thank you mark um it's you know it's a little bit the same as as climate so anyway that's my question is there any in, well, in uh, possibility I, I think that the issue is really whether you could get the legislature to do a an exposure limit for instance instead of 0.8 parts per billion over 24 hours you could say because of the combinatorial risk in braddock from uh fracking water being dumped into the river and many pollutants coming their way from being so close to the highways with diesel fumes, we are entitled to a stricter, tighter standard. And the problem that you would have is that you'd have to get that past the Pennsylvania legislature because the people in Fox Chapel are in Allegheny County. Allegheny County has uh, no uh, meeting of attainment but people in fox chapel who have the 10 acre horse farms don't really have the same health effects because they are so far away from the pollution source so it's a great idea to have a stronger standard to protect those who are most vulnerable but i can see the lobbyists and the legislator pouring millions in to try to defeat any combinatorial risk based standard. I mean, it would be a great idea. You can ask that of candidates for election and see what they think, but boy, it would be a tough one. It would, it would really take a lot of, uh, would take a lot of politicking to get that through. I mean, I'll give you an example. This is a, an example from a Supreme Court case some years ago. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, in its wisdom, decided that the best thing to do with hazardous radioactive nuclear waste was to um, bury it in what they call repositories. So Nuclear Regulatory Commission came up with this idea that you could safeguard all of the local Indian populations from the risk of breathing radioactive stuff with the repositories that they were going to uh, that they were going to they were, that they were going to have for these things. So Nuclear Regulatory Commission passed what they called an interim standard for disposition of thermonuclear radioactive waste. And um, their standard was challenged because there was no place where the zoning regs allowed you to bear, bury thermonuclear waste. And the people who opposed this rulemaking in the case, National or uh, yeah, Natural Resources Defense Council sued the Nuclear Regulatory Commission saying, guys, you don't even have a place that you can bury it and you don't have any current sites under construction where it's allowed. How can you say that this is a valid solution to the where to put nuclear waste problem? And uh, it went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, oh, they didn't do such a good job constructing that statute. Well, send it back, send it back on remand, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, you need to take a better look at, you know, what you're gonna do with this nuclear waste. And so it was like 10 years of litigation and the US Supreme Court comes in and says, well, you know, so it's a 250 year, life that it's going to be radioactive so what that there's no place to put it so what that the places where you're most likely to put it would be affecting the most vulnerable people in the population i mean everybody knows the health problems on the indian reservations are just terrible and the supreme court said well you know just go back and have another crack at that statute would you i mean that's what you're 
that's what you're into with these challenges, petitions for review of administrative agency decisions. I mean, the only ones I've ever heard of where there have actually been um, successful enforcements of strict statutes have been New York State. New York State forbade fracking in the upper Hudson Valley because 2.1 million people in New York City did not want frack water in the water source that was going to provide their, their, their metropolitan water. 50 miles to the east, look what the Northeast Kingdom did. Oh, you're going to frack near our wells? Well, you need to prove to us that your particular well was damaged by our horizontal. And, and you're a guy making $30,000 a year. How are you supposed to get some professor to prove the groundwater hydrology all you know is that you can't drink your water and it stinks and your cattle aren't going to, uh, to drink from it. But that wasn't enough. That wasn't enough for DEP to come in and really put the hammer down on the frackers because after all, fracking is a property right. You know, when you sell your subterranean estate to the frackers, so what? I mean, it, it, Pennsylvania's system really pales in comparison to what New York was able to do. And, and New York, uh, hats off to New York, because if we could be half as good as them, we wouldn't have as many problems as we do, so. And hats off to um, journalist and writer Eliza Griswold. I would be holding up the book, except I'm attached to a wire here, um, who wrote, embedded herself with families in, She's wearing a wire, affected, watch out. I'm wearing a wire. Uh, with families affected by fracking. And hats off to our next governor, Josh Shapiro, who transmogrified the book into legalese as the, the grand jury investigation and prosecuted those fracking and pipeline companies. Mm -hmm. I assume he got wind of the book and um because i read the book and then later a few years later i read the um at least parts of the grand jury report and it's like this is amity and prosperity that's what this is this is that so kudos to people who write books oh speaking of books i wanted to let folks know it is linked in marin's in the marin's list entry for this event um sorry i'm not doing individual events because Blogspot changed their platform and I can't set dates in the future and that just magnifies the time enormously. So I just sandwich other events into the salon notice, but uh, there is a book talk by an author who um, we, in that book I do have in reach, da 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 da, um, who we had for a, um, um, a salon over the summer. It was one of our in-person salons when the weather was warmer. And uh, Shanti Gampa Robindran, who is talking about energy policy um, uh, in the recent past and going forward. And uh, Neil, who you just heard from, um, is going to be an interlocutor in that conversation at Riverstone Books on Tuesday evening at 6 p.m. There Ooh. is a link. They would like people to register, although I'm sure that if you just happen in, you probably wouldn't be turned away, I'm guessing. But there is a link to register. I can grab it and stick it in the chat here as well. Uh, but I should be paying attention to what else is going on in the chat. Um, yes, there is. Uh, um, so maybe I won't. I'll just send you to Marin's list because all of you have the Marin's list. Uh, entry for this salon and it's just in one of the events on November 15th um so uh yeah the vo additional vulnerability I'm trying to remember who it was who was talking at with me at great length about um cancer patients really need to have cleaner air uh because their body is you know fighting this one thing and it it's it's much more vulnerable and uh people who live surrounded by all these combinatorial hazards um 
are, you know, and it, subject to many health risks, whether it's asthma or COPD or heart attack or cancer of one kind or another, which sometimes the type of cancer depends on what the chemicals are because um, you get some certain certain industries cause certain kinds of obscure cancers. Um, uh, vinyl, people who work in vinyl fabrication plants die of some particular obscure cancer at really high rates. And the companies covered it up, of course. There's a movie about that called Blue Vinyl. Um, and I really wonder whether uh, John Fetterman's stroke, you know, it's hard to say that this hurricane came from climate change, but more hurricanes are happening with climate change and more severe hurricanes. So did, you know, was John Fetterman's stroke related to the fact that he lived across the street from the Edgar Thompson work steel plant mm -hmm. for years. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, still does most of the time. So, uh, and I've seen nothing about that. Um, I actually uh, sent uh, Giselle, his wife, a uh, message uh, yesterday about this saying, hey, this might be interested in hearing about some of this air quality stuff because people who live in polluted areas like say Braddock have a lot of health issues like say stroke. Um, and uh, so that I think that point is likely to be made more abundantly um, in times to come, um, or at least I hope it will be, uh, because maybe that could get him serious. We also, he, in the debate when he was forced under very difficult circumstances of 67 questions and 15 second rebuttals when he had to read and process everything, um, he came out, he was like forced to say, I support fracking because those were the only words he could manage to come up with. And um, there's talk of trying to get him on one of these frackland tours, which uh, were very impactful for, uh, I mean, Lois uh, Bjornsson has been doing them for years now. And there was a whole series of petrochemical tours and uh, steel tours, um, of which hers were, were just some, um, down in Frackland and people from the DOE and people from other countries contemplating their energy plans, energy policies came on those tours during the, uh, energy ministerial that was downtown, uh, in September. And it was just really a great opportunity to get, and, you know, we, keep wanting to get more policymakers on them and Fetterman having come out. And previously he'd said that he didn't like fracking. And then when it was being contemplated in Braddock and he wanted to keep US Steel happy, he said, okay. And now more recently when he was on the campaign trail and he didn't want to lose all the union votes or whoever he was trying to curry, um, he was more favor favorable. And then in the debate, he just, I, I think he was forced into a corner of not being able to come up with a different sentence because of his auditory processing issues right now. And they may improve, but even if they don't, he's still way better than us. And part of the, um, uh, part of the blue return to the Senate. So Neil has something to say. Oh, I just wanted to make, it's not, obvious to me that that everyone quite got what I was saying, because this is focused on uh, exposure justice in, in people in places that have higher pollution. What I'm saying is that if you live in Lemington and you're African American, and I don't actually know that the pollution levels are kind of average for Allegheny County there, but I bet they are. It's still an environmental justice issue because the chances are your risk of dying from the same level of air pollution is higher. And so it's a, there's another, and I, I'm pretty sure, though I still have to run the numbers, that, that that overall risk is actually bigger than the risk of people living close to. The, they're, they're still both very serious issues, but, but, but the, the, the one I'm talking about, I think has been overlooked. And so 
it, it's it's not just living in Braddock or Liberty. It, there's a much much bigger issue here, in my opinion, or that 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 I'm I'm kind of intrigued by. Well, I'm not intrigued is not the right word. I'm intrigued as to whether they're legal. If there's legal standing associated with it, I'm I'm horrified by the by the issue itself. You know, Neil. Every time that I have encountered um, discussions of issues of um, some people being more vulnerable than others, it's been I've been led to understand by others who I have thought knew more than me that, oh yeah, we account for vulnerable people in our average standards, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, how much they account for that, and do I think that there's a there there even with that general blanket assertion? Yeah, I, I'm inclined to like follow the lead that you're pointing to, but I've had a similar kind of question without all the data that you probably have access to, um, just of like, well, aren't vulnerable people, like aren't there like whole groups of vulnerable people who are like just dying under the same air pollution and shouldn't that be integrated in the regulations? And they're like, yeah, it already is. And so you, there's no there there is what I've sort of bumped into in my explorations. So I, I don't want to dissuade you from going, trying to find a there there, but I want to prep you for that might be a common response that you get from people. Um, Melanie just uh, shared in the chat that over the last two weeks, um, she and her neighbors buried eight people who died of cancer. And in addition to those deaths, several others with pre-existing conditions passed away abruptly during the recent um, air, bad air episode in the Mon Valley. So condolences and we have to change this because condolences aren't enough because they're just gonna keep coming. And, and even if people don't die, there's quality of life, there's, living where your life is dominated by dealing with the healthcare system and dealing with pain and stress and not having any energy to live a life and families torn apart. Um, so it's not, it's not just the, the numbers of deaths, although those are definitely very sobering. Um, it's all the other people who didn't die, but are living with all of those pre-existing health conditions because of the polluters that are surrounding them. And then we talk about not wanting to become another, become Cancer Valley because of like Cancer Alley in, in Louisiana, which is a stretch of the Mississippi. I think it's a hundred and, I forget the numbers, but something like 50 miles and there's 160 polluting facilities, petrochemical plants and such. And they, you know, not looking forward to the emissions from the cracker plant, which have already begun, but the orders of magnitude. And thankfully, they just, I think they fought off another plastic facility. Formosa was going to be um, building a new plastic plant of some sort or other. But they still have the other 160 or whatever that number is. It's big. Um, and so... And they are just, you know, how anybody is even still living there, but everybody and their brother has cancer and or other ailments. And that's that is just compounding the whole environmental justice situation because there's just it's a vicious cycle. You can't you don't have the leisure and resources to fight off a new facility coming in. You don't have the resource, the financial resources to move elsewhere. Um the community is under-resourced as well as the individual people and families being under-resourced because their tax base is low. Um, and just, and, and you're, you, part of the reason you don't have resources is that you can't work because you're sick. So you might be scraping by on disability or whatever, um, or your family, depending on your family or being on the streets. And it's just, it's a downward spiral and the polluters are just walking away, patting their pockets. Um, there was a, someone somewhere commented on, on, um, uh, we were talking about, you know, market issues and, and who's, 
the 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 fact that the businesses get to uh, internalize profits while externalizing costs, which I don't think those words were said, but we had been talking about that all along. Um, I was uh, in one of my early years uh, on the board of GASP, I was part of a group that was monitoring uh, changes made at the Cheswick Power Plant to comply with a uh, settlement that we had sued. Well, we had threatened to sue them and a settlement was reached where they gave us some money for air quality education and we were, and, and they promised to do a bunch of modifications to improve their, to reduce their air emissions. And this was in the early to mid aughts. And so we went to a lot, I spent time inside the bottom of the smokestack at Cheswick and learning about electrostatic precip precipitators and all these other things. And, but um, even more time in meetings with the plant management and the plant manager said, um, and I quote or paraphrase quite closely, we would love to be a great uh, corporate citizen neighbor and eliminate our emissions and be super operate super cleanly, but it would cost more. And therefore, and 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 it would put it at a competitive disadvantage in the marketplace, in the marketplace. And that uh, and we have a fiduciary responsibility to our shareholders to not do anything that would reduce our profits. So so much for being a good corporate citizen. And it's that fiduciary responsibility thing that is just so deeply in, buried in our whole financial system. And there are starting to be efforts to, to wean the economy from that through B Corps, benefit corporations, where you are allowed to have in your mission of your company, um, community benefit, or at least avoiding community harm. And you don't have to do anything and everything that will maximize profits. And I wish they would catch on a little bit quicker, but at least they exist. So some right-minded people can um, pursue that. Uh, but anyway, just some meanderings. Let me get back to the uh, chat. Um, Greg has pointed out an interesting metric for measuring the health effects of poor air quality, both chronic, but especially acute episodes involves recording how hard pacemakers are working during major air pollution episodes. You can't access individual data for obvious reasons, but you can access metadata. That sounds very fascinating. Would you like to talk any about that, Greg? Not, not really. I, I just know that that's out there. Uh, you can't obviously access individual data, but you could mm -hmm. probably, you can certainly get the metadata and one wonders whether or not certain aspects of age and race mm -hmm. and obviously locality would be would be uh, would be accessible for anyone who mm -hmm. wants to research that. Yeah, well, we have a couple of biostatisticians here. Any thoughts from Roger and Abby? Who may have stepped away from their computer, but um, anyway, if you'd care to chime in, uh, you and they're also former GASP board members. Thanks for your years of service there. Um, so, oh, and Barbara points out, many people don't want to move because where they live is where their families have always lived. The industries moved in and produced the health risks. So that's another thing. You know, People shouldn't be forced to leave where their roots are, just as the um, people who are now being forced to leave because of climate risks. And Melanie had something to say to that, yeah. Yeah, that's one of the things that I wanted to mention too. Uh, our family, which I don't have a lot of the history, we do have a family tree, but our family long owned land here before the mills came. And it was a large tract of land and it was called the Randolph Hollow. And my paternal father's father, they 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 had cousins that moved up because of once the mills came and even then they still knew to buy land and i think that that's what is an issue for like pittsburgh compared to philadelphia 
they're talking about land grabbing in Philadelphia. And I, I mentioned this in the chat, um, so I'm sorry for repeating it, yeah, but the you. mayor, when my father passed away in 2013, he didn't write a will. I know that's not smart. He knows that. He's just, he's a stickler for certain stuff. But we, he didn't have any excess in on his home because as a as a, a elected official, you couldn't run for office if you have so many back taxes. Whenever he passed away and my brother, my last living sibling passed away in 2020, I wanted to get the house into my name so that I would be able to get access to the, the monies that were out there and also um, put the house into a better space so that if I rented it out, I would have the air filtration and things of that nature that would make me feel comfortable for renting it to people moving in into this space. And I was told to pay $80,000. No, no idea where this number came up from. And even after asking, you know, making a right to the request, where did you come up with this money? They just say, either you pay it or you don't get served. And, and it's fortunate for me that I have a support group like you all, but for other people in our community that don't have this type of support, they walk away from their homes. And then you find a lot of blight in communities like ours. And then you also find a mayor that works for industry that buys up these properties and now rents them out for section eight. So there, it just seems that Pittsburgh is very comfortable being very far behind and backwards in their thinking. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, you know, that it's nice to say it, it can be shifted, um, but I don't know what it would take. And like, for me, I want to know, how can I go over the Allegheny County Health Department? <laughs> you know, who can I talk to over them that would take the information sincerely and empathetically to say, this isn't right. Like, but Carolyn, you know, so gracefully does and says, this isn't right. It makes sense that this isn't right. And this is what could be done, or these are ways that it can be shifted and shaped so that it gives people uh, the motivation and the hope that their actions will eventually, if not change it for myself, my grandchildren and their children. All right. I'd say here's hoping, except we can't afford just to hope. What was that about uh, running for mayor, Melanie? <laughs> I'm going, I did commit to attend some meetings, the lady told me. I, I guess it's just a um, little bit, little bit like, huh? I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm having enough trouble as it is, right? Mm. <laughs> but I, I would, I would love to, you know, if the, is it, if it presented itself, I, I would love to run for mayor. I think it would mm -hmm. do my dad some good to see me active in politics. Mm -hmm. Or write a book. Here's that Amity and Prosperity uh, by Eliza Griswold. And um, I was so. thinking about looking uh, to, to there's there are certain groups that they have to support you in writing a book. And uh, I don't know if I shared it with you all, but I am um, certified death doula and it's an end of life mm -hmm. doula. Mm -hmm. And I thought if I could bridge the end of life doula with the environmental justice experience of living in Clarendon, that'd be a great book. So got any tips for me? Shoot mm -hmm. them my way. All right. Well, there are lots of things hither and yon in the chat. I don't know if folks have the energy to keep going or um, uh, we still have quite a few folks here with us. Um, are, are there questions that people like to bring to the fore? Although, I mean, I can keep trolling the chat. Um, but there's a, certainly a great deal of appreciation for all of the presentations. Thank you to Carolyn, Melanie, and Patrick. And thanks to Mark for, as always, chiming in in very helpful ways. Um, so uh, anything important that I missed? Do folks have more questions they'd like to, or comments they'd like to share?
going to want to. Uh, let's see. How do I do this? Who have we got? Oh, Di um, yeah, who is? I was, I hate, I'm, I'm very bad at ending conversations. <laughs> but I don't know if we should end because we still have more and I can keep going through the chat. Carolyn, go for it. Oh, I think Carolyn had to go, I guess. I don't know how to do a little hand. Like um, yeah, just speak up then. That's fine. Oh, okay. Sandra? Yes, hi. Yes, well, thank you. I don't, I had to leave for a, a, a little bit, but I, so I don't know if my question was answered or not, but um, I had asked in the chat um, box there, if, um, if there was an organization that monitored the uh, judges. Yes, Caroline it, talked it, about that. It turns it. out to be really hard to find out who authors opinions and things. So there was some discussion about that where Caroline, who had to leave just now, uh, was the expert. Did anybody else take away anything useful? Okay, I'll talk later. Uh, so I'm not sure, but this is being recorded and uh, you could go back. I did, I did ask your question um, out of the chat earlier and we talked about that a bit. So Caroline had some useful insights. Um, Barbara. Alexandra, I can't give you good details because my memory is not as good as it used to be. But I remember back in the days when we would hang out in front of Toomey's office on Tuesdays, mm -hmm. there were people either from League of Women Voters or Fair Districts of Pennsylvania who came to talk with us about the importance of the judges. And I think that one of those groups is, is connected to um, volunteers who do track judges' performance because they were talking with us about that. But I couldn't look it up during the course of this meeting, so I'm not sure how difficult it is to find out. And as was discussed in the meeting, it's really a difficult issue. So it's important. I hadn't really thought about the importance of which judges we vote for until um, maybe it was Fair Districts of Pennsylvania or the League of Women Voters with them who spoke about it on one of those Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. So I do think there are people that are very interested in this. I just can't connect to them directly. I'm too uh, disorganized. <laughs> so yeah, thank actually, you, Marin, for giving yeah, me a the, chance to say something. Yeah, there was a, um, uh, a fair amount of, of intelligence that someone had around the time of some very important uh, Pennsylvania Supreme Court judge elections. And I'm not sure where the information came from, but um, any if anybody's here who isn't already, if, if you're on Facebook, there's a group called Order of the Phoenix, which started as a post-Trump election in 2016 um, uh, network to get together and have potluck letter writing sessions. Um, but it has become an important uh, mm -hmm. nexus of local uh, progressive information. And if you aren't on it, contact me and I can get you an invite. I believe it is currently a private group. So, all right. And Greg wanted to say something. Just a friendly reminder. I think that all of us on the call would, would know this, but to remind, of course, the judges when they run are not allowed to take positions on the issues in the same way that a standard politician is. So all of these quote unquote assessments of judges have to be done by sort of uh, third party watchdog groups. They can't, you can't ask a judge, how would you rule on this environmental issue or, or, or any other issue for that matter? Yeah. But, but there are groups out there that, that do sort of monitor those and ask them questions and look at their past track record and, and, and past statements. Mm -hmm. Oh, and also um, while we are brandishing books, I'm not sure where my copy is, but we have another book author here with us is Alexandra Kemmerer, who is a poet and wrote about mill towns in a small book of poetry. Yes. I don't know if you might like to say anything about that, or you could hold up a copy because you can lay your hands on it quicker. Oh, 
You probably could. It's called Mill Spit, and it's about mm -hmm. the mills down in uh, the Mon Valley, in particular the one in Denora. Mm -hmm. And uh, tidbit yeah. was in the next. Just thought I'd give you a shout out because there's a lot of ways that I mean Melanie has talked about how important it is to have an educated populace because if people are just listening to what the steel company says and rooting for their football team, which is apparently the big deal in Clareton. Um, and I do encourage folks I, in the Marin's List um, de event description, it has a, uh, a link to an article about Clareton as a whole written by a new public source journalist, and uh, which was really eye-opening. And <laughs> some of those things I'd heard about before, but um, it was just, uh, um pretty there's a, just a lot going on places are complicated and there's many ways to educate and through art is part of it there was a wonderful uh photography exhibition um uh several years ago called uh oh in the air visualizing the air we breathe or something about this and mm -hmm. and there were three photographers and um, it was it was an amazing exhibit. There was one person who had giant portraits of survivors of the Denora smog, which happened in 1952, I think, or 1948. And 48. Yeah, 48. And the London killer fog was in 1952. Mm -hmm. And um, and people telling their stories and. In the, so there were like captions was this story that this person and then you could see the person in now in this giant portrait there was people who someone had uh, documented people in medical facilities dealing with being unable to breathe and other health problems because of bad air there were someone uh, there were photographs of people living in the shadow of smokestacks and things and and the exhibit was powerful, but it was even more powerful when the photographers talked about the people they'd been photographing and their stories. And GASP had um, helped put together an event, uh, sort of opening the exhibit, which was held at Pittsburgh Filmmakers. And, um, and it was so much more powerful with the people that I worked to get I, I, same as those Frackland tours, we have to get our policymakers in there. So I worked to put together another event aimed just trying to get as many policymakers. And there were fairly few that came, but a few did. And hopefully it was impactful for them. Um, and that exhibit um, we featured in a sustainability salon back in the days when they were in person um, uh, several years ago, and it exists online. And we've been talking with some of the photographers about kind of giving it a new life and doing more things with it. Um, there were some conversations we've had at GASP and uh, with the photographers. So, um, anything else I missed going by? We need to use all the tools at hand to support us in living a better life especially when we know the air pollution is preventable. Well, the trick is the, the way the financial system is and the incentives are. So industry <laughs> internalizes the profits and externalizes the costs. Um, Patrick, you've been quiet for a while. Do you have any more that you'd like to say before we wind down? Uh, no, I've, I've appreciated <laughs> listening to, to our conversation. I've got a great document of notes here uh, that I, I plan on uh, ask, you know, bringing up in our staff meeting tomorrow, <laughs> uh, you know, to talk about how we can, you know, we can follow up on some of this. I'm also interested in more uh, conversation after this. Uh, that's the nice part. This is generative. Um, so, so uh, it, I think Melanie and Caroline and Mark and, and Marin in particular, uh, following up and, and talking, um, uh, talking about some, some of the ideas raised here could, could be really beneficial. Um, okay, so, yeah, so that's, I've been, I've been engaged in my note taking. <laughs> oh, good, good. Um, there is a There's question a as to whether, uh, anybody knows more about the carbon dioxide 
a leak in Samaria, Mississippi. There, I did read an article about it. I can't remember the name, uh, but one of the new um, air quality issues that we're going to be dealing with if uh, if this country's energy future involves a lot of carbon capture and sequestration is going to be carbon dioxide pipelines. They liquefy it, they send it through the pipes. And if that pipe ruptures, you can't breathe it. It's heavier than air. And so people will die. Um, uh, Neil might be able to, if he's still with us, might be able to say more about the details of that hazard. But there was an incident with a liquid carbon dioxide pipeline Oh, Sataria. Yeah, Sataria. Thank you for correcting that, Barbara. So there was an article. Uh, I can probably find it. If other people want to talk, I could probably find it in some saved Sataria in a Zoom chat somewhere. Because there was an article that was linked in a Zoom that I was on. Ah, yes, it is an article. Oh, no, I'm afraid it only linked to this one. So I'm not sure where that article is, but somewhere there is telling and I think it was pretty lethal. Um, there have been events where underground un underwater. Um, thanks for coming, Greg underwater uh, carbon dioxide was freed and bubbled up and killed people around whatever that body of water was, I think in Africa or something. Uh, but don't quote me on that because I can't remember any details on it. But you don't wanna be around large, large concentrations of carbon dioxide. It's fine in air at, I mean, in terms of breathing, it's not gonna hurt us at, at 450 parts per million. It's just in terms of climate. Um, but if you have a lot of it, it's very bad. Oh, thank you. Uh, Barbara posted a link to an article. And it was Satartia. Yeah, I wondered if that was it. Let me see. There was a different article. So I will try another search. Yes, I have four chats that mention that. Uh, but I can't search for them while I'm talk the one talking so anybody else want to say anything <laughs> or shall we just wind down and say thank you all thank you to our speakers thank you to our participants um uh various we had someone from county council someone from the dep we had linda from raucous uh we had somebody from new york city um lots of Lots of movers and shakers were here. So thanks for making it all uh, happening. And I will, I guess, adjourn. Um, thank you all. And thanks to Mark, as always, who puts things together so well. You do. You do, Mark. You, you might not realize it, but you do. I'm glad to be in this mix, and I think it's worth a little call out that that the monitors, you know, that that the monitor deployment of purple airs really started in earnest when I came to the salon and asked who wants to go in on a bulk purchase with me, and the salon just leapt at it, and we ultimately, with the help of some Heinz money, bought ultimately a hundred monitors that then we started deploying all around the 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 region, and now to see like. Two million ish dollars flow in to support the deployment of many, many dozens and dozens more low cost monitors is really, it feels like a cavalry has arrived moment for this little piece of the, you know, our, our corner of the movement that started at your house, Marin. So, yeah, salon, well, another salon victory, I call it, is now gone, gone full bore mainstream with support from the EPA. Yeah. So here we, um, uh, helped populate this map. I remember today in 2017, good day. in 2017, there were only monitors, a few at Albert Presto's lab. 
and you think of this map as empty with just a couple and then like it took years to fill it out but now if you scroll back even further it's and just mark has been getting them going up here this is mark's doing uh yeah. getting this not monitoring network um i'd like to see more to the northeast you've not been able to find hosts i haven't i haven't had the funding capacity to go up northeast mm -hmm. i would love to see them in newcastle like way up north there to see more yeah, but there's other groups you know now hey, now there's really a... um Christian's farm oh he'd be great They'd host one yeah in a new york minute yeah that's um, great they're somewhere right out here west of zealy i think oh cool yeah that'd be perfect and um yeah I'll, i'm I'll out of grant up. money but there's a new this new funding for the shell stuff should have plenty of money to put out okay. monitors out there i mean it's a little further out but i think I looked at a windrose, which yeah, is this, I hear you. it's it's data on how much of the time the wind is coming from which directions. And by and large, it's I mean, I pay attention to wind direction because I see radar. I mean, I'm a gardener. I I hang my laundry outside. And so I pay attention to the weather. And the most common wind direction is southeast to northeast. Yep. Sometimes from the south, sometimes from the west or southwest to northeast, sometimes from the south, sometimes from the west. But um, when looking at the location, just sticking to this map for a moment, up here is Beaver where the Cracker Plant is, and here's Pittsburgh. We're not in the overall wind direction, but there is a lot of funneling down river valleys, or in this case, up a river valley. Because so I'm not saying that Pittsburgh isn't going to be affected, but it's not going to be nearly as strongly affected as, say, the town of Beaver, which is a mile away. And to, right, like here's the plant. Uh, yeah. Here. Right there. Yep. Yeah. The highway. Okay. So the plant is here, and this is the town of Beaver, a lovely little town, which is going to be so sad and unhappy. From the emissions from that plant that's going to be the single most affected and then Monaco also to some extent because there are a lot of winds from the west but there's winds i'm not sure i guess what i'm the data that i'm looking at is the winds at the height where the rain clouds are because i'm looking at the movement of the rain and that may be different than the height neil can you say anything about that the winds the anyway he's working on other things now okay he's doing other things now he's not being helpful here but it's possible that you know different winds you know the inversion kind of stuff trapping things in river valleys that that could go in different directions including up river to us uh but the industry wants to build four or five more of these things and then there will be all the ancillary industry of manufacturers that will take those nurdles and turn them into crap we don't need yep. and occasionally crap we do like medical stuff, but anybody saying medical equipment, we have to have plastics because it's needed for vital medical equipment while they're eating off of a plastic, eating with a plastic fork is uh, just horrible. So I'm going to stop sharing this lovely map. Yeah. But it's nice to see the green stuff. It's a nice day today, probably because it rained and all the crap got cleaned out of the air. So, okay. Uh, I think I'm really gonna shut it down. So well, thank you, Maren. Thank you all. <laughs> yeah, and thank you. for such a wonderful session. Um, Maren, I wanna stay for just one tiny oh, sure. little note at the very end after everybody's gone. Okay. Bye-bye, bye, everybody else. All right, nice take care. Bye-bye. Nice seeing you, Patrick. Linda. Good to see you, Mary. Oh, thank good. You so thank much. you, Melanie, for Sorry, the, Melanie. fighting Melanie. the thank good you. fight for so long. It's such a it's such an upstream battle. I just really want to say it out loud and acknowledge it. And Thank keep... you. You're helping me. You're helping me. I'm going to get read Alexandra's book and some other books that were mentioned here. Keep it up. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okie doke.